it's not knowing about the debt. If I had made the biggest mistake, I don't think I'd have a rental yet. I think I'd still have to work. I'd still, I think I'd still have 15 years of work in front of me if I made this one mistake. And since I didn't make this mistake, I was able to go from a really bad position to reach financial freedom in less than 10 years and make work completely optional and actually walk away from a job this year because I didn't make this mistake. And I kind of asked in, uh, you know, on Facebook in, in the one rental at a time group for some guesses at what do you think of the biggest mistake is with debt? And I think there's some mistakes that most of us make. So I don't want to call them the biggest one. This one is, is something that we do without realizing it, which is the bigger mistake. <clears throat> most of us wake up one day, like financially, we have two lives, right? The life before you understood finances and the life where you started to self-educate and figure out that there might be a better way to do this. And normally when we wake up, we have debt. We went to college and took student loan debt to cover living expenses and the cost of their courses. We, as one of the guests is on Facebook, purchased more car than we should have. Credit card debt. We've, we've built up all these debts. Some of us, <laughs> that wake up moment happens after we get a divorce and we find out about $89,000 in bad debt in our name that we didn't know existed. So one of the big mistakes, so not the biggest mistake, but one of the big mistakes is making bad debt, not knowing the difference between good and bad debt. Um, one of the answers on Facebook was uh, the guy cheated and he gave both. The answer was uh, not having enough. That's a mistake with good debt, not having enough. And then avoiding that at all costs uh, was the, it seems like we used both ends of the spectrum there. If you never have that moment where you realize the difference between good and bad debt and you just want to get out of debt altogether i think that's a mistake but the people who realize that there is good debt and bad debt and they take their their focus away from uh spending money spending future money borrowing money from themselves before they've even earned it you know with with more bad debt so first thing stop making bad debt learn that there's good debt and bad debt but here's the biggest mistake. And I think this is one that a lot of people talk about. If you follow certain um, mental ideas like uh, Dave Ramsey, avoid debt at all costs, uh, or Robert Kiyosaki, get into as much to good debt as possible. But you have that wake up moment where you have bad debt. You spent some time uh, when you moved out of your parents' house and you got into more credit card debt, vehicle loan debt, student loan debt, that you, you realized your income wasn't going to support. Here's the biggest mistake that most people make. They focus on eliminating all bad debt before they invest. When I found out about 89, it was a lot more than $89,000, but here's a really quick tip. It was over $313,000 in bad debt in my name. Uh, but I had talked to one of the lenders uh, trying to figure out who they were and how to make these payments because I didn't know this debt existed. And my spouse had filed bankruptcy. So our debt became my debt. And they asked me if I intended to file bankruptcy too. And before I could answer, like, you know, I was trying to work in law enforcement at the time and uh, bankruptcy is a career killer. So it really wasn't an option. I um, was hesitating to answer. And the guy said, actually, I think it was a woman the first time, said, if you intend to file bankruptcy, we'll take 20% of what you owe. And I realized that was a thing. So I turned the 313 into 89. So $89,000 that I had to take care of. If I focused, when I first started, I was a single parent with three kids making $17 an hour. I had been laid off from a police department in 2008, started working at a truck driving school, teaching people how to drive trucks. Went to, to work driving a truck, making good money, but that company went on strike and then ended up at the school. So that was my position. $89,000 in bad debt, not making a lot of money, trying to raise three kids. I, if I sat back and I thought, okay, so I've never in my life had bad debt. I don't use credit cards, uh, vehicles, I pay cash. Uh, I, I didn't accrue student loans. I joined the Marine Corps. And then I did a lot of correspondence courses at Chapman University. I clept most of the classes. So I didn't create the bad debt that a lot of people have. I didn't have the mindset of understanding good debt versus bad debt. When I first found out about the bad debt, my knee-jerk reaction was, 
how do I pay it all off? Like my life is on pause until I pay this debt off. I'd still be working on it. I'd still be trying to pay off bad debt if that was my focus. So here's the solution. Here's what worked for me. Instead of focusing on paying off bad debt, being able to reach financial freedom in less than 10 years, make work optional, walk away with no bad debt, and a lot of good debt, not as much as I'd like, but a lot of good debt. That's the first thing to understand. That we wish we'd had more debt when you realize what good debt is. The first step to investing and working towards financial freedom is in a couple of videos. I've got like the, the six steps to getting started. The first step is the same no matter what your position is. Whether you have no bad debt, you have good debt, you have bad debt that you found out about, whatever the position is, making a lot of money, not making a lot of money. First, we need to learn how to save. And saving is not just spending less. It's increasing your income, side hustles, overtime, changing jobs, working for a promotion, whatever it is to aggressively make sure that you can have more income coming in. And then reducing expenses. You have to learn how to save first. So you make this saving. And then the idea is the, most people who struggle with that most of their lives, if they get to the point where they finally realize bad debt is a thing and we should stop creating more bad debt, and they do, then they spend decades trying to tackle the bad debt. Instead, what I did is I split my saving in half, like a 50-50 column. 50% of my saving rate took care of. Now, here's a new term I want you to write down. If you've been following all of my content and you know good debt versus bad debt, asset versus liability, I want you to write down worst bad debt. Bad debt is subject to gradation. If you have a, a, a mortgage on your house and it's where you live, you're not going to turn it into an asset. You're not going to rent out rooms. You're not going to produce income from it. The debt on that asset is bad debt. It's not producing more income than it costs to service the debt. And it's at a fixed rate. That's not the worst bad debt. Like most people have that bad debt and still reach financial freedom. But if you have an adjustable rate on a credit card and then the Fed fund raises their rate from almost zero to four and your credit card goes from 12 to 18 percent and it's adjustable and it's for things that you probably purchased years ago, don't even have now. That's bad debt. High interest, adjustable rate, consumer debt is worse than fixed rate debt on something like a house. If you have uh, any kind of debt that has a balloon payment or you have a loan structure where in five or 10 years, you're going to have a loan reevaluation period. That's debt you want to tackle faster. So depending on if you're an investor, if you're somebody who had that wake up moment where you just realized what money is and you want to start taking care of it, that 50% of my savings rate was dedicated to the worst bad debt, the highest interest rate, credit cards with an adjustable rate. Um, there was uh, a discover card there was three things that wouldn't adjust the price. I focused on them uh, as the worst debt. The other 50% should be set aside to acquire cash flowing assets. You can only develop a certain amount of side hustle. You can only work a certain amount of overtime. You can only get so many promotions. You can only change companies for so much of a percent of an increase in your income, 10, 20, 30%. But as you acquire assets, and the cash flow from the assets adds to your income. And in my case, it was actually house hacking. Now, this isn't going to work for everybody. This is this is something that I suggest everybody at least consider. And for most people, uh, we did a version of it with, anytime you had roommates. But as soon as some people feel like they have a mortgage, they can't have someone else pay the mortgage. They want to pay it all themselves. So I purchased a duplex, moved into one side, rented out the other. That lowered my housing expense from $1,500 a month down to $300 a month, greatly increasing my saving. If I continued to work, continued to live in my house, never added 50% of my saving into this other column so that I could save the down payment, closing costs, and money for repairs and moving expenses to get the duplex, there's almost nothing I could have done that would have made a $1,200 a month change in just two years, right? It took that long to save up the money. Probably could have went a little faster if I didn't take care of some of the worst debt, but 
I believe getting rid of the worst debt and simultaneously at the same time, saving 50% for cash flowing assets. And I kind of drew a, uh, an imaginary line at 6% interest rate. Everything that was above 6% interest rate, that 50% of savings went towards. Everything below 6%, I paid minimum payments. And once I started house hacking, I saved for another two years, continuing to do the same thing. And at, and at that two-year mark, I purchased another duplex that wasn't a house hack. So now it was a duplex that was cash flowing. I was house hacking my house that I had moved out of for those two years uh, between waking up and buying the first duplex I had rented apartment in, in between and rented the house out started to cash flow. So I had multiple sources of cash flow coming in from cash flowing assets. I had increased income at work. I had worked overtime. I developed side hustles, literally playing World of Warcraft and selling things online. Um, when you're a single parent, you have to be creative with uh, developing a side hustle that keeps you around the house. That one mistake of people sitting back and going, I can't buy assets because I have this bad debt. Split your money, take care of the worst debt, but continue to hunt for the great deals in whatever asset class you choose. Now, it could be stocks, it could be crypto, it could be running a business, it could be investing in real estate, it could be the 500 different ways to invest in real estate. That's probably a really small number compared to how many there actually are. But working towards the income snowball while doing two things, stop creating more bad debt, but focus on the worst debt. And I, I think this is where I really come off with saying, the average person can reach financial independence and make work completely optional, even if you're not starting from the best position in less than two years. Because other than a major health concern, I haven't been able to think of things that might have made it harder for me to go from the position I was in to the position I'm in now. And the purpose of today's live stream is to get through as many questions as you have. Uh, live stream will last as long as the questions do on how to reach financial freedom, how to handle bad debt. And, and the thing that's most important to me, how do you create good debt? And, and what to you makes the difference between bad debt and good debt? Because if you wanna start an argument <laughs> with people who haven't studied money yet, try to convince somebody who's never thought of the concept before that debt can set you free. So we get to the comments here, Matthew, howdy. Got snow on and off. Uh, Washington has snow, but we've got ice on the roads. Not as not, not enough snow, though. It's not quite like Siberia, where Matt lives. If you get locked out of your house here, you're not just going to die. Um, Dan, howdy. As I mentioned in a previous live chat before, a tenant caused significant damage to a property of mine. It will probably be a complete remodel of the interior. That sucks, especially depending on how much damage they did. Um, I have two options on how to pay for the high cost of damages. Use half of my emergency fund to pay for it in full. Use the home equity line of credit, is, which is adjustable and currently at 6%. What would you recommend? So if half of your emergency fund would take care of this, it's kind of the purpose of the emergency fund. I wouldn't want to create debt, especially worse debt, the adjustable rate to take care of it. If you didn't have the emergency fund, the HELOC might be an option, but it really, that 6% on the money that you borrowed to do these repairs is going to make it a harder to get the return. A lot of times when we start investing and there's a and there's damage in our, our rental, you know, a, a hot water heater breaks, garage door quits working, whatever it is, first couple of years, it feels like we pay for that repair. It really does. It feels like we reach into our bank account, we take the money out and we pay a contractor or right. That, that money is ours that we're spending for the first couple of years. Here's where I'm hoping that you can get to, Dan, that reserve that you've built. When you purchase a cash flowing asset like a rental property, we run the numbers, right? We, we want to calculate the yield. We want to know what the cash flow is. And we, and we do things like what is the cost to acquire? So down payment, closing costs, immediate repairs, all of that it took to get the asset, which you had and then the tenant trashed. But part of that expense, when we're looking at the cash flow, is we take all of the rent that comes in, whether, you know, coin-operated laundry, late fees, all these things, rent that can come in. And we take out principal interest taxes and insurance and setting aside for repairs, maintenance, and vacancy, right? So for me, it's 15%. I do 10% for repairs and maintenance, 5% for vacancy. Uh, if you have property management, you might also set aside for that. But with that 15%, 
in the first couple of years, it feels like it's your money because you built the reserve. But that reserve that you have now, if you've had it for a while and you will have it for years, when you take half of it to make these repairs, that 15% of gross rents fills the account back up. That's how I've taken care of any repairs I've ever had, uh, not by taking out debt to, to do it, uh, although it, it, it is an option. It's not one I would go with. We, we You have a few options anytime you have, um, people call it equity. I like to call it the ability to create debt on an existing asset. You can sell in 1031 to get money. You can take out a second mortgage instead of messing with the interest rate on the current mortgage. You could take out a home equity line of credit. So the, the second mortgage is a way to do this with fixed rate debt instead of adjustable rate, but like the HELOC. But the first question, before you figure out which one of those paths you want to take, is do you have a way to use the money that's going to create enough of a return to justify not only the debt that's on the asset you're probably buying, but the debt on the existing asset? And in that case, if, if it was me and I had the option of using reserve and having 50% left, even after doing those kind of renovations, yes, I would focus on refilling that reserve after. That's the route I would go. I wouldn't touch this, the home equity line of credit. Uh, and, and especially if you're kind of new and you have three or four rentals or less, um, you might underestimate the repair cost. Having the, the HELOC as an option is, is there. You might underestimate the timeline. All of those mistakes, if you add a HELOC to it with an interest rate, I think it just makes it easier to make a mistake that ends up costing you more. So the way you worded the question would make me go, I'm going to use my reserves and I'm going to refill them as quick as possible. Howdy, dividend day. All Nighter Hider, you are here creating after creating a ton of laughter in New Hampshire. You're in New Hampshire. I thought you were in California. You travel too much. Angelina, howdy. Lesser Focus Solutions. Happy to be here. I'm happy you're here too. Tom, howdy. And then I see Tom, you did a super chat. How do you conduct or analyze an inspection? That was a great question. Thank you for the super chat. I appreciate it. Hopefully, that is kind of why a couple of you are here. Every time somebody does a super chat, YouTube tends to share it with more people. So how do you conduct or analyze an inspection? Lumberjack Landlord, uh, after doing probably dozens and dozens of inspections, started doing them himself with his experience in running crews doing rehabs. Um, I've been investing for a little over 10 years. Um, I still get an inspection by a company a couple reasons it's an uninterested third party that puts the the damages that they find in the most most per, cover their butt format you can think of they want to make sure that nothing that you find wasn't noted so it's it's in um, articulate language that can be used as a powerful tool to negotiate with the seller to either have you know bring less money to closing table get things fixed you know those seller concessions are easier to do when you have um, parts of your uh, inspection report to use for that, which is also one of the reasons why I'm not a real realtor or a real estate agent is because in some areas, you're not allowed to do that as an agent. As a dumb, uneducated investor, I can do things like send this page to the seller and say, this is the these are the repairs that I want taken care of or the cost I want adjusted before we continue with this. Um, so when you analyze an inspection, you're going to get some, it's going to be between somewhere between $300 and $1,500 to have them go, depending on whether you have a single family house, duplex, triplex, fourplex, or what they're looking at. A commercial, it gets a lot more uh, you know, involved than that. But it really makes sense. If you have a duplex, you're talking two crawl spaces, uh, possibly even if the attics are separated, you know, different areas to check, uh, two electric panels, like two water heaters, like all these things that, it, that literally doubles the amount of work that they're going to be doing. So it will increase the price. It doesn't really double it, but it does add one or $200 to the price of getting an inspection done. For the first, I think three or four that I had done, I was there and I wanted like an in-person debriefing at the end by the inspector of what they found, because I thought there's probably some things they're not really going to get into the inspection. They might be able to explain better face to face. And I never found that to be the case. The 72 to 85 page detailed inspection report that you get from a, an inspection company has everything you need in there. Pictures, paragraphs, stuff that you're not going to remember in a conversation anyway. So I haven't gone to the last couple of inspections and I wait for the inspection report to come. The first couple of pages on the inspection report is going to have a lot of items that are in red. 
That's the that's the way that an inspector says these are immediate attention items or safety concern items or big cost items that you want to look at before you continue on. So the first thing you want to do is go through all the items that are written in red and make sure that you understand them. You're okay with what it would take to fix them. After that, when you're looking at things that they talk about repairing, talk with investors in your area and talk with contractors in your area. Every single inspection that I've had here in Washington state said, your electric panel has to be replaced. It's this version that always fails. I've been there since 1984. It's never had a problem, but it's going to fail now because you bought it. Um, I have replaced one electric panel in any of my rentals ever, and every single inspection report said they needed to be replaced. But all of the contractors that I talked to around here said, right, it should be replaced. And when it fails, we're going to replace it. Um, that doesn't mean ignore it if it says yours needs to be replaced because they might have fall, found a fault in it. All mine were working fine, had no problems. Um, so go through line by line. And, and before you take big action on anything, like I said, make sure you check with investors in your area on what is normal, what is expected in your area. It's very different if you're where the lumberjack landlord is and you have things like heating systems that we just don't have in Washington, like you have baseboard heat or a space heater in a room and that's it. Um, I'm sure there are people here with central air, but most most rentals, uh, at least class series, don't have that. Um, so that that is how I would do it. If you're going to do it yourself, I wouldn't do it until you've sat through several inspections with an inspector, probably dozens, and and have experience running rehab crews, uh, doing maintenance repairs, you know, having a good idea of what you're looking for. So I don't think I'll ever get there. I actually don't want to. I don't want to be that good at that. I want to pay. $600, $700 for somebody to go look at my duplex and give me that detailed report that I would go through in that order. What's in red and then take any kind of items like that to a contractor and see what their their opinion is. Because the, the inspector's job is to make it sound scary. Like these are really important and you should take care of it. And to me, in my experience, 90% of the things that they said absolutely had to be done, I've never touched. Um, and that is based on the, the advice of the contractor. And believe me, contractors want to do the work, but they're not going to do something that doesn't need to be done, um, depending on your contractor. Dividend Dave. We appreciate that. Thank you. I got a bonus today at work. Spent it on this super chat. God bless everyone. Absolutely agree. It's great use for a bonus. Although if your bonus is $5 at work, Dividend Dave, you, you might want to look for work. Move across the country which you already did. Uh, that's awesome. Let me find where I was in the chat. Success is a journey. -o. Howdy. Howdy, everybody. And to the other one riddle at a timers. Lauren, you're off the clock tonight. Nice. Good. So I don't have to wish you a very boring night in the ER. <laughs> nice. Uh, Paula, howdy. On either hider, successful hunt today. So I'm going to have my hands full of uh, nice. Good. Hopefully you found the right deals. Laura, howdy. Good to see you here. Matt, my biggest mistake is finding Ramsey before Dion. I, and so <laughs> I, I don't know that that's a mistake. I, I don't know that he has any bad advice, right? I think the, the millions of people who've benefited from waking up and going, wow, they're there's a way to live without creating more bad debt and then following his steps. It's not the best advice for an investor because without good debt, what we can do would just take decades longer if, if we could do it. I don't know that I would own a duplex yet if I had tried to do it all cash. Um, and there are some people that I have conversations with. There, there's people I talk to and they go, um, I live in this really expensive area. I'm looking at um, investing out of state because there's just no way I can do it here. And I'm like, awesome. Let me introduce you to Millennial Mike. This guy house hacks an expensive cost of area. And then he invests out of state. He's got tons of info. He's willing to share, right? And then I've got other people that want to self-manage and do most of the work themselves. Here's Lumberjack Landlord. Here's how you do it. Here's somebody who has systems on how to buy one rental at a time. Like I can refer people to people uh, specifically doing what they're looking to do. I have conversations with people. And based on my opinion of their ability to understand good debt, I'll say Dave Ramsey is the person for you to go watch. Like, that's not the person I'm going to say, 
you should invest in real, because it's not for everybody. I will say, if you can get debt under control, you're going to have a much better life. Because like, that's the thing destroying everything for them. Um, so yeah, I don't know if it's a mistake to find him first. All Nighter Hatter. I am way happier and less stressed now that I've got a financial education. Uh, anybody who knows me, people who know me point it out often of what a literally different person I am seven or eight years ago to now. Uh, yeah, that's not even something I could put in words. Uh, the amount of mental stress that's gone. Um, if I can put this, if I can say this without getting emotional, sometimes what you do, what you think you want to do is what's causing the stress in your life. And there was, there was one time where my daughter, my older daughter said something that just struck home with me so hard. And, and it wasn't about real estate. It wasn't about investing. It was, it was about a life change that, that changed from a stressed out, angry person to a decent human being, I think. And then from that, I've even become much happier. But after getting laid off from the police department in 2008, right, it was, it was eight years of law enforcement, and, and I wanted to work in law enforcement, work towards a pension. My goal was that, and I enjoyed the job. I enjoyed the department. I was a great group of guys and, and women that I was working with. Loved the job, just like I did the truck driving school. And when I got laid off, that wasn't my choice. Like retiring from the truck driving school was, I've got financial freedom. I'm out of here. There was, there was no hard feelings on, on my side. But losing the law enforcement job um, was very stressful. And then finding out about the debt was, you know, it didn't help. But I went to teach at the truck driving school and I was there, I don't know, six months or a year or so. And my daughter, who is now a beautiful woman, but at the time she was a teenager, came to me. And I don't know if I've ever told her I cried after she left, but she came to me and she gave me this big, huge hug. And we're not really a hugging family. And she said, I'm so glad you're not a cop anymore. You're just so happy all the time. And that was before even really getting on the path to financial freedom. A simple change in your life sometimes can make you happier than you think it's going to do. Lauren, literally just got off the phone with your EA and had this exact same conversation. Nice. Sierra, howdy, you made it. Make sure I'm not missing anything here. Okay. All that rider, thanks. Northwest coat, ha coast, howdy, ching, <laughs> uh, Tom, um, Dylan, howdy, made it. Um, success is a journal. Good debt is a powerful tool, but bad debt can kill you. Kiyosaki, absolutely. Yeah, Jamie, howdy, good to see you here. Curious to hear how it goes with your test. Let me know. CJ, howdy, Christopher. Howdy. Strider, hello. Great to see you. Howdy, Tiffany. Zero to hero. Here we go. Can you shed some light into the split level duplex versus the side by side duplex? Would you offer less money if it was a single family split duplex versus a side to side? So the, the amount of money that I'd really be willing to offer would be based on the rents that I can get. So if you're in an area where a split level and a side by side would rent for different amounts, uh, it could affect the income, the offer that you make. So what what would those units rent for? Just like if you're looking at a side-by-side -side duplex and it's two bedroom, one bath, two bedroom, one bath, or three bedroom, two bath, three bedroom, two bath, you're going to offer very different prices because the rents are different. Even though the square footage was the same, uh, tenants don't think in square footage, they think in bedroom count. So I have this list of criteria. And I'm going to rattle them off as quick as possible. This is the criteria that make, made me able to walk away from a job making six figures, knowing we're going into a recession and have absolutely no hesitation whatsoever because I diversified my portfolio in a way that limits tenant turnover and diversified my tenant base toward pandemic, stock market crash, government shutdown. None of that can affect me enough to where I'd have to go back to work. And what I love talking to the, the haters and the naysayers about is when they say, well, what if rates double or triple? I'd be like, that'd be great because it doesn't affect you if you have fixed rate debt. Um, I say I want, I want several economic drivers like a base, a port, college, hospital, Boeing, Amazon, large population, like, like all of these things. I want three or four of them, right? Or more. And, and where I invest that, there's several. And then I say I want side-by-side -side units with 
two or more bedrooms with a garage because more space equals more stuff. I want washer dryer hookups in the units um, because it, you know tenants living in a place where they use shared laundry or a laundromat are just waiting for a place to open up. Like all of these concepts that I have to to make me feel very confident in my my portfolio's stability. But it's a wish list. I don't think any one of my properties checked off every single box, right? And I never maintain a perfect one-third military, one-third section eight, one-third working or retired. It kind of hovers in there somewhere. Like it, it's a it's a goal that I shoot for. So I was doing um a Zoom live when I was one of the teaching assistants with a, I think it's second or third bigger pockets uh, boot camp class. And I said, okay, so, and I've done this with my members only live stream too. It's like, let's open up an email and from my agent and I'm going to kind of walk through, this is how I, uh, you know, take a knee, a quick microsecond uh, view and then make a knee jerk reaction to whether I do a deeper dive into uh, a property or not that, that, you know, it's from the auto searches from my agent. So it, I've done that with my members only, but I was doing this with a bigger pockets group. And I, and I was expecting like every other day to look at a bunch of properties I would never want. Like, I know they're terrible. It's, you know, it's why they're on the MLS so long or whatever the thing was. So I opened it up. The first one I look at um, was a triplex um, uh, over under in an area. It might've been a duplex because my memory is not right, but I know it was an over under. And, but the yield was great. The location was great. It had the parking I like. Like it had everything except it was over under. I prefer side by side. And so far, all are side by side. But with that over under, I looked and I, I checked off enough of the other boxes to where that one was missing. Like I, I invest in a town called McKenna, Washington, which has like 650 people in it. I want a large population, right? That's one of all of those checked boxes. It wasn't there for that city. Still bought that duplex. Still cash flowing with that duplex. If I can't, it was over under. I actually texted my agent during the thing. I was like, here's how it works. I'm going to text my agent. Here's the asking price. Here, here's my offer price. Here's my earnest money. Here's whether it's going to be owner occupied or not. Here's my, uh, um, one of the things that I put in there. Um, I wanted, it was either five or 10 days inspection period. The more seller friendly the market is, the shorter the inspection period is, the more buyer friendly, the longer a time I can take. I forget what it was at the time, but I, I, told I was sharing with everybody this is how I did it this is what I put in the text sent it off to the agent during the class because I was like this has everything that I would look for but it's an over under so while I prefer side by side if it checked off enough other other enough other boxes I would do an over under um you could have noise complaints you have usually a family that doesn't have a yard I, I do like uh, most of my properties the tenants have their own fenced area the fourplex I think is the only place where uh, they don't have their own fenced areas all the others do um, and I haven't had much turnover at the fourplex ever. I haven't had any turnover at the fourplex. So the, statistically for me is, is panning out the same across the board, single family to small multifamily, same turnover rate. Um, so can you shed some light into the split level duplex T to a building layout? Is, is it separate metered? I would check that. Uh, is it zoned legally as a, as a two unit? Because uh, you don't want your tenants to be able to go and find out that it wasn't permitted correctly with the city. Um, so those would be the things that I look into. But I would have I, I uh, I'm looking at a split level right now um, in a town called Roy. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's a little bigger than McKenna, but not much. And I would look at considered you know turning the garage into more bedrooms downstairs and separating it out. But, but I would have to put in a second, second um, power meter, right? And some other things I'd have to look at. I would figure out the cost. I would get some quotes. I would add that to my cost to acquire. And I would see if it was still cash flow after that. So I would consider that too. I don't know that I'd want to, if it wasn't normal for the area, if you're in an area where it's just not allowed, it, um, or if the property doesn't allow parking for that, you know, most properties will have two parking spots, at least in my area. So know what's normal in your area. And if you have a split level, two parking spots might not be enough. Most tenants want two spots. So if you have a duplex, you want four spots. So a lot to consider in there. Um, Ninja Vanish, howdy. Michelle. Howdy. Not enough snow come to Linwood. I know uh, a friend of mine uh, was working on online with their, their company and everyone around us was talking about the snow. And so the, the, the Tacoma area didn't get much, but around us here in Tacoma, 
Seems like everybody got a bunch. So, financial firefighter, howdy, aloha. Zero to hero, a college degree would be good debt if you are able to get a job that pays you a wage you are proud of. Would you agree? Um, a devil's advocate for a second. Absolutely. If it gets you a wage that justifies the debt, like if you couldn't make that much money without that degree, yes. If you couldn't do the job you wanted to without that degree, yes. But if it gets you a wage you are proud of, the proud of parts where I would, would disagree. Um, because if, you, if you're proud of it, is it covering the debt and making your income higher? But there are some people who want to work in There are some people who want to uh, work as an accountant and the degree is going to help. They want to work in the medical field. The degree is going to help. Yes. So there are, there are some routes where a college degree is good debt. And um, the, my problem is if you go into good debt at a college, but you use your college debt to pay for housing, you use your college debt to pay for the course, it's adjustable rate. There are times where it might make, make sense to focus on paying that down, especially if you're not working in one of those fields where if you work for uh, nonprofits or government jobs over enough time, you can have parts of it forgiven when you hit a certain age. Like there are people who aren't planning that. They just they just create all the student loan debt. And then some people don't even finish and get the degree. The debt is still there, right? So it it's like your house, right? A person's house is a Schrodinger's good debt or bad debt. You don't know until you look at the numbers. If you look at a house, if you bought a house in Seattle and it's five bedrooms, four bath, and you have this huge mortgage, most people would go, well, that's pretty bad debt. But if you're Todd Baldwin and you buy five bedrooms, four baths, and you rent out each room and you buy five or six of those houses and you cash flow $40,000 a month, that looks like pretty good debt, right? So you don't know until you see the numbers. So the college degree, yes. Um, he doesn't watch my, well, he watches my short content, but he doesn't watch my long content. So I'm gonna talk about my son for a minute. Went to college, uh, had a scholarship to one college for wrestling, had a scholarship to another for academics, chose the one for academics because of a girl who then broke up with him two weeks later. Finishes out at that school with a four-year degree. Uh, it creates about $54,000 in student loan debt. Goes to PayPal and uh, doesn't make a lot of money. Graduation present from his dad was, hey, let me put you through my CDL school. So I paid the owners for my son to go through our CDL school uh, so we can get a driving job to make enough money to pay off all the student loan debt. So a business information systems management degree didn't turn into money, um, but a CDL did. That doesn't mean all degrees go the same route. And there probably were things he could have done with it, but it wasn't jobs he wanted to do. Uh, so you you definitely have a point, but your second comment here, I see, it's a gamble. Because what's in demand right now? There are counselors telling you what's in demand right now. They don't know what's going to be in demand in four years or six years, depending on how long you're going to be in the school. Uh, it is a gamble. The island of Hawaii had hail yesterday. And you just got a volcano going off. You got hail going on. It's like all a micro environment there. Nicholas, howdy. Howdy. When did you decide to buy the nice new truck, bad debt? I really want to buy a new one, but I know it slows me down on the rental asset growth. Okay. So like I said, at the beginning of this, I never really had bad debt. And then all of a sudden I had bad debt that I didn't know about um, because I paid cash for cars. And in, in the beginning, they were, you know, $3,000 cars uh, for, and I had to have three so that one would run well enough to get me to work. So I started investing. Um, first five, six years were really slow. No expenses, no vacations, none. No vacations. Didn't take any time off. Um, work side hustles, focused on the worst bad debt, you know, adjustable rate, high interest above 6%, and focused on saving for assets. By house hacking, renting out the house, adding a duplex, and adding a duplex all within about six years, getting seven cash flowing rentals. It was about the eight-year mark where financial independence happened, but not financial freedom. So I could make work optional, but I still had to look at price tags, right? That's the, the differentiator there. Uh, started cycling through the better cars. And I have a duplex that the cash flow in my mind 
is separate is it all because all my stuff goes through one account but in my mind it's separate the cash flow from that is called the vehicle duplex healthcare duplex travel duplex if i buy seven or eight more there'll be the dating portfolio but it just depends on how much money you need for that so i've got the vehicle duplex that of when i first purchased it was kicking off 800 900 bucks a month pretty much a 450 a side or so uh and now it's uh, pretty close 13 28 yeah, 1600 in pure cash flow right now. That's the vehicle duplex. So that asset isn't producing money for me to purchase some other assets with. It's producing money for me to purchase the liabilities with. Um, but I still buy a couple year old truck. I'm never going to buy a brand new one. And I think right now, so I've got the, the truck now and in 2025, maybe 2024. Yeah, 2024 probably. I'm going to purchase another truck. Uh, that's probably being built today, right? Or or next year, probably. Um, so I still don't go and buy the brand new, it's going to all depreciate real quick, kind of expensive vehicle. Um, but an asset is paying for that liability, not me selling my life one hour at a time. So at the, at the eight-year mark, I had the cash flow coming in from the rentals. I was able to save 100% of my income from work and uh, it started at like 30%, but uh, eventually I was saving... 60 plus percent of the rental income too, that money was going towards um, vehicles. So the first five years suck. They just feel like they take forever. I was, uh, 2018 was the first time I ever took a vacation. Uh, took a month. And then one in 19, skip 2020. <laughs> uh, and then 2021. And then earlier this year, a couple months in, in uh, Florida, got Vegas coming up. So all that comes later. Literally every day gets to be a vacation if you skip the first five years or so. Angelina, regarding what Dan Hunter said about paying for repairs, would borrowing from retirement accounts be an option? So kind of like the home equity line of credit, uh, you're going to create debt on, on an existing asset. The, the retirement account is the asset. You're going to create debt on it by borrowing against it. I would... That's a great question. I think I'd be more comfortable with borrowing against a retirement account than a home equity line of credit because the retirement account, if you can't pay it back, you're going to lose the retirement account and probably incur taxes. You're not going to lose the house that the HELOC is on. Um, but I still, I emptied my retirement out, account out in 2020 when they waived the 10% penalty to put the money into a rental. Um, I have got about 11,000 trapped because I left some in there a little bit, tiny bit, and then contributed uh, for the last couple of years. Um, and so January, I'm going to empty that out uh, and put it towards rentals and just pay the penalty, pay the taxes, because I won't have any W-2 income next year. So I'll be in the lowest tax bracket. <clears throat> so I'm going to take it out and do that. So I don't know about creating debt on it. Anytime I talk retirement accounts, there are two people benefiting from retirement accounts, Angelina. The first one is your employer. They took part of your compensation package, lowered your wage to create a match that they could put into a retirement account, tricking people. That's my opinion of all retirement accounts is that they are manipulation to get people to work longer, more longevity at a company, more vested interest in that retirement account. You can roll it to the next account. You can, you can self-direct and do all these things. But there's a reason why employers have these meetings called retention meetings. How can we trick people into working for us longer? We can raise their wage or we can do a match. We're not going to raise it. We're going to keep it the same. We're actually going to pay them less. We're going to take that match and put it in a retirement account. So that's the first person benefiting from your income. The second one is the people running their retirement account. So I don't know if you saw my live stream this, this weekend, but it was who's using your income. The second person benefiting from your retirement accounts. Here's a really quick example. If you have $100,000 in, in your retirement account and the, the, the management company takes 1%, just 1%. Some, some take half a percent, some takes 3%, but we'll do 1%. That means they're going to make $1,000 this year off of you. If you made money on your retirement account and got up to $110,000, they're going to get $1,100. They get their 1%, right? So you made more money, they made more money. Totally makes sense. But if you lose money, if you lose 10%, you're down to 90,000, you lost $10,000 of your money that's in your retirement account, the people managing your account still get paid 900 bucks. They get paid whether you earn or not. So Borrowing against it, maybe, depending on what you're doing with the thing. For me, the preference is take it out, put it to work. 
uh, stop having money trapped behind all kinds of hurdles and barriers. Um, and then some people will say, well, you just self-direct it and buy a rental, right? And eliminate all the benefits to owning rental property, like depreciation, self-managing, like all the things that draw me to it. You can do that. Um, if you consider borrowing against it, or if you consider taking it out, or if you consider anything with the retirement account, here's the first question. Just like with the home equity line of credit, before you touch it, do you have a way to put it to work that's going to justify the cost? It has to pay for the penalty to take it out. It has to pay for the taxes to take it out. It has to actually produce income on the asset that you're buying. If you're borrowing against it, you're going to have interest that you're paying against it to pay it back. The thing that you buy has to do that. So I don't recommend touching retirement accounts to anybody who has done like three or maybe four rentals or less. Because those first few is when we really make our big mistakes. <clears throat> so if you miscalculate, you, you put at risk your retirement account, you put at risk the home, the line of credit that the property is, is you know, with the property that it's on. I wouldn't do that until you have the basics down and a reasonable sense of confidence that not only do I know I can find the deal, but when I find the deal, I'm going to know how the process works. I know the carrying cost. I know how to estimate rehab. I know how to find and screen in place and keep tenants, like all those kind of basic things that you don't really have in the first couple. Uh, my first few years, I lost money. Like I had no idea what I was doing. I was not self-educated. I didn't read pod, you know, books, listen to podcasts. And I didn't talk to investors. I was just going to replace my income with no education whatsoever because I'm that smart. That's why I lost money. Then I educated myself and I, I still didn't touch retirement account money until 2020 when they waived the penalty. But that was after close to, 10 years, like nine and a half years of investing. Uh, so with the experience, and then I was like, yep, I bought it. I know the return I'm going to get. I know where it's at. I know the place. I know I have the property in mind for it. Um, so that was a good question. Hopefully that helped. Bolo, howdy. The Ramirez real estate team. Howdy. Great information. Thank you. CJ Underwood. Yes, zero. Going to school for four years for liberal arts versus computer science is a big difference. Yes. Uh, there there might have been a time in the 70s or 80s where people used to say, well, we're going to hire someone with a degree because they're more well-rounded. Didn't matter what the degree was. There's a couple little niche, like some state jobs where that's still a very poor way of looking at it, but a way that people hire. But the studies in the last couple of decades have been people without a degree will end up making more money than people with a degree, unless the degree is tied to the income. Uh, so. Brock, howdy. I know that you look at listings every day, so this likely wouldn't happen, but is there a cutoff number of days on market that a property is sitting where you wouldn't consider it? Uh, gr brilliant question. Literally the opposite of the way that I look at it. So for the last couple of years, it's been really a seller's market and, and things sold quickly, right? And the prettier the property was, the quicker it sold. So, you know, something that needed way too much work or, or had problems with permits or whatever could sit longer. <clears throat> so that might have been a negative. So speed was your friend. You, I, you wanted an offer in within minutes of it hitting the MLS. You wanted multiple searches set up so that it would come in quick, not get it two or three days later. You'd waive inspections. You would, uh, not, you wouldn't, but some people did. Like I never waived inspections, but they would uh, offer to name their kid after the the seller, and they didn't even win the property. Like all of these things to try to get the seller's attention to buy the property. So we really didn't even have to look at days on market. The shift with the raise in interest rates, prices haven't dropped enough yet to make people jump on it, uh, jump on the properties, means I'm actually looking for days on market. And then considering without looking at listing price, what what numbers make sense to me to make an offer? Is It It could be 80% of what their list price. It could be 10% of what their list price. They can be listed for a million dollars. I might offer a hundred thousand. So, right. So, and there's, there's like no rhyme or reason to it. It's been on 20 days. So I'm going to do 5% under. It's not like that. You look at the, the property. What is, what is average in that area for, you know, in my area, if they were on for two days, there was probably something wrong with it six months ago. But now if it's on for 20 days, that's when I'm even going to start looking at it. I, I don't even want to look at the stuff that's been on the first uh, couple of weeks. It's on the MLS. Um, that doesn't mean it's going to be that way forever. This is kind of a pendulum. It shifts back and forth. We're not really in a buyer's market, but we're closer to a buyer's market now than we probably have ever been. I wonder if I took a picture of this. You probably won't see it on screen very much, but right here in the median, this would be uh, the lower half is easiest to buy. So if it's down here, 
up here, it's easiest to sell. You've seen the last couple of years, it's all been up here literally at the top of the chart until the last few months, it's dipping down. We're not quite down to where it's easiest to buy, but we're not all the way up where it's easiest to sell. So no, I, I, uh, a lot of listings will go 90 days on the MLS and then they take it off or some will relist. So if you're at 100 days, that means they're, they've stayed on at least once. Um, and I think that's when I would start looking at what offer half of list price, 80% of list price would make sense in your market with that property. And it's a good way to start the conversation. That, that listing agent has that on the back burner going, yep, it's been on there for 100 days. I'm not even really thinking about it. So you call them and you say, or you have your agent call them and say, what are the three things that matter to the seller? And why do you think it's not selling? Find out if there's a problem that you can fix. Yeah, that's a good question. Nick, howdy. Good, Dad. Things that make you money. I have three doors now. Awesome. I am in the on the hunt for a good CPA. Any ideas on how to vet them? Uh, yes. So make sure that they designate themselves as a tax professional dealing with real estate, right? And make sure that's in, in their, their conversation with you. Um, CPAs are a weird, it's, it's a weird group. Um, one of the things I do is I really try to reward agents and people who work with me, um, handyman, lenders, by giving them referrals especially having 12,000 people on a YouTube channel. Um, when someone reaches out and says, hey, I'm in this area, who would you use? I could send it to my agent or my lender and say, hey, here's a connection with somebody. I'm not an affiliate and I get paid whenever I do those. I'm just trying to help the agents and lenders. That I like that they want to work with me in the future, right? It works out for everybody. But my CPA, this is the only like contractor type person who said, we don't take on new clients. Don't send us anybody weird industry. So I would check with other investors in your area to see if there is somebody who's taking on new clients and get their their face to face just like when you're hiring a handyman go to local REI meetups and get a face to face review of the work they've done the rates they charge and how reliable they are um you know I've got a couple of handyman and, and uh consistency is one of the reasons why they don't have regular jobs right so I just have to be aware of that when I use them and then anytime I give, give a referral to my handyman I literally go to the person I say look you're gonna get a great price you're gonna get great work I don't know when it's gonna get done though you can have good fast cheap pick two I get two of those can I have three Nicholas so I'm sorry um Nick Cummins too how would you vet them? Uh, that's a good question. Because I'm not, I don't work in that realm. I don't even, I don't know people who work in it other than the ones that I use. Making sure that they understand real estate uh, and have the bandwidth to take you on. Um, reviews from other uh, investors. There, there is one thing that you could take the time to do. Uh, I wouldn't do this if you're just starting out because it's really not that important yet. But when you have a portfolio of five plus properties and you start to have the difference of tens of thousands in your tax obligation at the end of the year, and it's $500 to $1,500 to have somebody file your taxes, have two people do it. Go to two different CPAs. Tell them you're doing this. Look, I'm going to see what you come up with. I'm going to see what they come up with. Whoever's better at the end of this is going to get who gets my business every year. I haven't done that yet, um, but it's how I've done with most contractors. Literally, it's just the estimate. Give me the estimate. So this one, you might actually actually pay for the work. It's just that one time. And some CPAs will say, if you have your taxes done with a CPA or tax professional, they don't have to be CPA, tax pro, bring me your returns. And I'll tell you if I would have done anything different. And some of them will do that for free. And then if they go, hey, Last year, you know, since you brought this to me last year, if you want, I'll file this for three, four hundred bucks. I'm going to make this adjustment and get you seven grand back. Right? It could, there could be something that big missing. That that is an extra step that you can go through. Nicholas, if you inherited a million dollars, would you buy multiple properties or would you be more conservative and just buy one each year? Dollar cost average approach. Um, that's a great question. So if you get a lump sum amount of money of a million dollars in, would you dollar cost? I have dollar cost average, uh, but a different version. So I, I, I think I fail every time I try to explain this. 
Um, but in stocks, you dollar cost average by taking a set amount of money on a set repeating timeline to buy. So if stocks are going up, you buy less. And if they're coming down, you buy more. Statistically, a very uh, safer way to invest in stocks. The version I do for real estate, and I call it that, it's probably a mistake, but I call it dollar cost averaging because I save up the money and I hunt for the good deal. So the two things that have to happen, I have to have the right amount of money. So uh, down payment, closing costs, immediate repairs, reserves, like all the things it takes to be able to buy the property. And I find the great deal. When those two things line up, I buy. I don't go, I'm going to wait for rates or prices to do up or down or whatever, right? And none of that matters. If I found the right deal and I have the money for it, I buy it. So if I had a million dollar lump sum, I think I'd hunt for great deals. I'd put the money to work. I wouldn't want a million dollars sitting in the bank. I have about a half a million dollars sitting in the bank right now. I'm hunting for the right deal. I am not um, buying one. If I found a, you know, a, a duplex that I could get a cash flow on and do the smallest down payment. And then if I find another one, I'd buy it. It doesn't mean I go buy the big fourplex. I buy the um, the property with the best yield that I have the money for. But that doesn't mean it's all the money. So early 2021, I, I started talking about my million dollar fourplex. I wanted to buy my next property to be a fourplex. It cost at least a million dollars. Uh, I wanted to save up $250,000 and you know, put a down payment, have the closing costs, have the reserves, have the money for immediate repairs. And that was my goal. And in May of 2021, I bought a duplex because I had the money and the great deal popped up. Those two things um, lined up at the right time. So that was my dollar cost averaging. So I'm saving, I'm looking for the next big deal. And if the million dollars came all at once, it would. It, so that's the money. You've got the money to do deals. Now you got to find the deal. So if I found the deal, great. If I only found a, I haven't seen one, but a single family house that cash flowed and was very much, and it wouldn't take much of the million dollars, I'd buy it and then take the money out of the money and put it to work. So it's those two things have to line up at the same time. You have to find the deal and have the money. Cool question. Strider, howdy. When are you coming to Vegas? Uh, I'm only there four days, 7th to the 11th. So with my memory, I only remember it because it's at 7 11. Um, I'm a five year old, but that's when I'll be there. So reach out. Maybe we can. I'm not doing any like events or anything. I'm just going to hang out, um, talk to a few people that are there, see Matthew Lumberjack Landlord, see Millennium Mike if he makes it. Um, um, we'll do some videos while we're there, but it's not a, we're not going to like rent a venue and do an event or anything that's going to happen when one rental at a time hits 50,000 subs and he's over 40 now. So Nicholas, another question. I'm almost certain a tenant has moved somewhere, someone in who is not on the lease. They pay on time every month and never bother me. Should I bring this up to the tenant or look the other way? Um, I prefer to have the names of everybody that's there on the lease. I have a friend who has a tenant who moved their mom in. I was talking to the tenant the other day. The, and I actually took about two minutes and, you know, cause it's a Dion talk. And now that person wants to put their mom on the lease because if that person that was moved in ever wants to go rent somewhere, isn't going to make more sense if they have rental history, they can actually call and say, yes, they're on the lease. This is the amount of the rent they've been paying consistently and be able to rent somewhere else. So to benefit the person that's not there. So I would run it by the tenant and say, hey, if you have somebody living there, I'd like to know, I'd like to get them on the lease. Here's how it benefits them. Now you have the names of everybody who ever needs to be evicted in the future, just in case you do. And that person gets rental history. So it kind of benefits both sides. Uh, you can look the other way. I have some friends who do that. I have some friends who don't even have leases, right? So you can make this as simple as you want. It's not how I would do it. I would want the protection of having the names of everybody in the house on the lease. But if you posit it to the way, this is how it can benefit the tenant. Uh, it might be an easier conversation. Then my chat moved. Sorry. Um which is awesome when my chat moves. I appreciate it because that means that there's enough stuff to keep going with the live stream. Because This is my therapy session. Thank you all for that. <laughs> Nicholas. Uh, okay, there we go. All Nighter Hider. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. So, Bolo, how do you join your class? So, the class I was talking about 
was the Bigger Pockets Boot Camp, which was on it was called the Real Estate Rookie Boot Camps. Um, they've now changed into like multifamily and some other ones, and I don't do that, so I'm not in the those. Um, I'm in one rental at a time's content. I produce content for that. I'm going to be in Lumberjack's uh, course. Um, there, there may be a day in the future somewhere where I make a course. I, I don't think I'm actually going to make a separate course outside of YouTube. Um, I want to be on brand with being lazy. And as much as I can, I try to just, you know, give the information away. As there gets to be more and more information, it's probably harder to filter through and find what you need. So I have a members thing where I'm doing members only live streams where I, I share a Zoom. You can jump on the Zoom if you want. You can watch on YouTube if you want. We actually interact. We open up emails. We look at deals. We look at markets. Uh, we made a binder. We talked about a binder. I actually need to make a binder. So Michelle, uh, you and my other friend both did the same thing. And I want to make a video with both of you. So if you're willing to, that would be great. Uh, the binder strategy was so effective that Michelle and my friend, who Dan, who's been on my channel and retired uh, this year, he retired August. Not that it matters, but 42 days later than I did. Um, I'm so petty. Uh, the tenants both suggested a rent amount that you were not comfortable with. So you lowered the rent from what the tenant suggested to a number you were comfortable with. Uh, both of you did that this year. Um, so I want to make that video. Um, but my members only live streams, it's, uh, um, uh somehow on youtube you can hit the join button some people don't have it on their device so they have to switch to a computer um it's like 2.99 or 4.99 a month um, there's currently no real difference it just depends on how much you want to support the channel um at some point uh there'll be there'll be a difference uh, and what i do is like what i'm going to do this week so a couple weeks ago i did a, a giveaway of um an hour so I had, I had a video last week where I talked about how much it would cost for an hour of my time. And I named an amount. And I said, if you don't want the amount, you can get an hour for free because almost every week I try to give one away. Sometimes I've given away with a dice roll based on how many comments were here um, or answer a question. Today, what it's going to be is after this comment with my email, every member who posts their freedom number I'll choose from that. And somebody, whoever, I roll the dice, the dice of doom, will win a free one hour, and I don't call it a consultation. It's, it's a Zoom call where we look at your finances, and I tell you, here's what I would do. I can't tell you what to do because I don't have all of your um, understanding of your goals, your market, your resources, um, but with the information you share with me, here's what I would do. So again, not advice, but a conversation. Uh, if somebody wanted to pay me for that hour, um, I set the price at five thousand dollars <laughs> because I don't ever want to do that. I want to sell my life one hour at a time. But I'm not stupid. If somebody wants to pay me five grand, sure, we'll have a Zoom call. Don't do that. Take the five grand, buy a bad rental, lose it all. You'll learn more than you could learn in an hour with anybody. Um, doesn't matter who it is. But so from that comment down, any member who makes comment of your freedom number, I will roll and give away an hour. It'll be 55 minutes because that doesn't create the tax event of a $5,000 one hour given to for free. It's 55 minutes, not the full hour. So that can be for free. Tom, I'm passing through Lynchburg, Virginia. Sounds like a real place. And I know one of you investors here. Go Flames. Nice. Cool. It's probably a sports ball reference. Not something I would get. Wayne, howdy. Do you plan to ever be out of debt? No. Nope. Absolutely not. Uh, there is no benefit whatsoever in having a paid off property at all. That just means I've got debt equity. Um, I want banks in first position to where if I ever get sued, the bank's going to be there to protect me. I can't lose the property because the bank actually owns first position. Um, it's one of my three forms of asset protection. I do have a paid off property uh, and it's kind of a cushion where I know I could sell, I could HELOC, I could refi, I could do all of these things with money that's sitting there. So that's kind of like a buffer, right? It's not something I wouldn't want the whole portfolio set up that way though. So I looked at debt like this when I was aggressively growing my portfolio, when I really wanted to reach financial freedom because I hadn't been there yet. I wanted to have around 70% debt to, to debt to value. So 
If I had a million dollars worth of property, I wanted seven hundred thousand dollars in debt. So I had three hundred thousand to where I could sell without having to write a check. I, I could handle downturns in rent. Like I was, I was stable. Once I retired, I wanted to be more stable. So I, I'm shooting for fifty percent debt ratio, and right now it's like one point eight million dollars in debt, five point five million dollars in value. So I'm less than where I want to be. So I might buy the next place with a lower down payment, might use a VA loan on the next property and have no down payment and increase the debt on that property. But and that would increase my percentage across the board on the portfolio. I don't want to be above 50% because I don't, I'm not working. I don't have that W2 security, but all paid off. The tenants will pay it off over 30 years. Uh, so yeah, when I'm 80, I might be debt free. I, I doubt it. I think at some point, Rates will drop and I'll just refinance. In 2020, rates dropped down and I refinanced some six point something properties to 3.0% properties, uh, greatly increasing cash flow. It's one of the reasons why uh, cash flow is so good on my portfolio, which doesn't suck. Um, so, no, I don't ever want to focus and pay off debt. Uh, there's no benefit for me. I have. I've talked about it. I've tried to be transparent and say, look, here's here's the thoughts I have, right? I've thought about things. I don't want to be debt-free. I, I want more good. I, I talked with people like uh, Cody and Christian of, of, with their multifamily strategy, and I, they have $12 million in debt, and I get envious. <laughs> I wish I had $12 million in debt. Um, it's not going to be my goal. I, you know, I wish I win the lottery. I still don't buy lottery tickets. Um, I like that I'm gaining appreciation on multiples of what I've invested without having to pay it off. So the bank doesn't get the appreciation on the total value. I do. Um, I don't want a mortgage for the interest to have a tax benefit, right? The tax benefits in real estate are depreciation and write-offs, not interest. It's just one of the write-offs. It's not the real reason to invest in real estate. And depreciation is the more important reason. Um, so I'm not saying go get a mortgage so that I'm not paying taxes because you pay $1,000 in interest so you can avoid $300 in taxes. That's not good math. Um, but I have talked with a couple of people of if I sold a property and took the the um, gains, paid taxes, and paid off two mortgages, I can increase my cash flow. So I'd have one less property, but probably two less mortgages. It's closer to paid off debt free, but I still wouldn't. And I still, I don't think I'm even going to do that. I've just talked about it to kind of like do like game theory. How would that look? What would the numbers look like? How would I feel if it, if it happened? Um, no. And that's like when people talk about mortgages, some people say, well, uh, would you get a 15 year or 30 year? And my goal would be a thousand year mortgage. In Japan, you have hundred year mortgages. I'd like a thousand year because I don't care about the debt. I don't care about the paid off property. I really don't care about the equity. I would like to have enough equity to where I could sell an asset without having to write a check. So that's a part of it. But I care about the cash flow. That's when I purchased. I purchased freedom where there's more money coming in every month than it takes me to live. And when I hit the 4X rule, it actually felt kind of silly to continue working. So four times my passive, my freedom number that uh, hopefully members are putting in the chat here, which I will check for in a minute. Um. It's a great question, and it's it's totally valid. There are some people who want to be debt free, and there and there are people who do what I did, and they invest until they get to you know seven to ten properties, and they start getting you know ten to twenty thousand dollars a month in cash flow, and then they live on five or ten, and they take the rest, and they just pay off the debt, and then by the time they're fifty five or sixty, they're debt free. Tons of cash flow, great strategy, too much work for me. I kind of like having the debt. I like that I'm still gaining appreciation on all of that. I still have the cash flow, and the and the as the cash flow builds up, instead of taking the half a million dollars and paying off debt, I'm gonna buy another property. It'll increase the cash flow and the appreciation. And every month, right now, it's I have to do the math. I need to do the math because I'm gonna I'm gonna make up a number because the last time I checked was like three thousand a month. It's got to be like thirty two hundred dollars a month right now, in principal pay down. Every month, the tenants are paying that much off on the properties, um, which is like a savings account that grows without me having to actively put anything into it. Uh, so what is your situation and your goals would dictate if it made sense to you? For me, it doesn't. Trucking landlord. Howdy. How much is Obamacare costing you per month? It's my final challenge to retirement. <laughs> Basically zero. Here's the beauty of real estate. Um, IRS, if you're listening, thank you. 
for setting up a system that helps people this way. Obamacare is based on your income, earned income. What you report on your taxes, how much did you profit? Well, with real estate, I ain't making any money. I'm losing money every year because of depreciation and write-offs. So when you go to borrow a to, to buy another property with a loan, lenders are going to take depreciation out. So it make, looks like you made a couple hundred thousand dollars. But on your income, on your taxes that get filed, because you moved from the employee or the self-employed or the business to the investor quadrant, and you ain't paying any taxes, ain't a word. We've changed. Uh, now, you get all this, I don't know. Uh, Without it, it would be like 1200 bucks a month. Um, with it, it's almost zero. So I haven't even, uh, what was I thinking? The amount of food I'm going to spend between now and Christmas is going to be more than my healthcare cost me. Mike, howdy. That was a great question, trucking landlord. Uh, so if you retire with a business that's producing money and it looks like profit, you might have uh, you know, one thousand to two thousand dollars sum on healthcare, depending on how many kids you have, might be a little bit more. I think lumberjacks is around twenty six hundred a month or something like that, two two to three thousand dollars, uh, big family, um, but it's less. And then then other people do um, geo arbitrage where you move to another country because, uh, oh, what is the healthcare system? It's Regents uh, in the U.S. is six hundred to eleven hundred per person, and you move to like Thailand, it's like sixty bucks a couple. Same coverage. Zero to hero. What would you look for when taking a job with a police department? Example, maybe Puyallup PD would be better than Seattle because you may be able to do your job. Maybe Seattle has better training. Um, so the academy is the same. Uh, I'll do this as brief as possible. Zero to hero. It's a great question, but this is a real estate channel, and I'm going to keep the law enforcement stuff as small as possible, like we do with transportation. Um, BLEA, Basic Law Enforcement Academy, is in uh, DuPont. Uh, service is basically the state for police. You have state patrol. Troopers have a different uh, of, of their own. So training to get on the department is about the same because you're going to the same six-month academy. Seattle's going to pay more than Puyallup. Uh, they just have a bigger fund. But here's why I chose the town that I was. I was in two different towns. Uh, one, there was five of us. <laughs> and the other was less than 50 of us less than 30 of us. But if you're in Seattle or Tacoma, where there are hundreds of officers, and you go to a call, you get you, you get sent out to a call, so you get, you know, you're four Paul 19 responding, take your call, you head out. If it involves a camera, you call a detective, and you don't handle the case in a bigger department. In the departments I was at, you handled everything. Like, there were detectives and they would take some cases that were going to take longer in court or more stuff, but you pretty much got a call. It was yours. And unless it really became multi-state jurisdictional, whatever, the smaller the department, the more work you're going to do on each case. So are you an adrenaline rush? Want to go call to call to call to call to call? Bigger department. Do you want to handle a call all the way through? Interact with people for months as they're dealing with whatever event you were called to? Smaller department. Is money a factor? Seattle pays more, but you got to commute to Seattle. You probably got to live closer to Seattle. And there's a reason why they pay more. Uh, best thing to do, and sorry, my stupid thing keeps telling me to run an ad, and I don't try not to run ads. So, uh, zero to hero, do a ride along, go to the department. And this is so, this is how I got to the department that I was at. I did ride alongs, I, I tested for 13 departments and I did ride alongs with about the five that I thought I had a shot for. And during the ride along, one of the officers talked about how the chief at our department, what that I ended up at, doesn't like people with degrees, doesn't like to hire anybody who's been to college. He says, I want somebody who can be in someone's face and de-escalate a situation, not somebody who can sit in a classroom for four years. So it was like his mentality. Totally get it. So don't talk about going to college when you're there. It's not that you hide it. It's not that you don't bring it up. It's that and he didn't care if he had the degree. He just didn't want you to think that was your biggest selling point. I wouldn't have known that if I didn't do the ride along. So ride with officers, find out what they like about their department, what they don't like about their department. Um, you know, if, if you find people working there who just hate the job, yeah. find out if it's them. Find out if it's how the department's run. Um, I don't know much about um, Puyallup. There was nobody in the academy from Puyallup when I went through. There was 
like 11 officers from Seattle when I went through, and I was the one for my department. So depending on department size, there could be more groups of people there. So, and when you go through the academy, they'll group you up with people from your region. So like I was in a town, uh, there was another town next to me, and there was a deputy for the county there. So like the three of us were in everything training together because we were going to be working together afterwards. I didn't get that as short as I wanted to. Sorry. Scott, howdy. Greetings. On this last night of fall, is this the, is this the 21st? It is. It's the 20th, right? Awesome. So happy solstice to those people uh, tomorrow. One of those being my daughter. Hope it's a great one. Tom, I'm trying to get good debt on a great duplex. Me too. I hope you do it. Um, but yes, I love having good debt on a great duplex. Um, yeah, it's amazing. Angelina, you were in the second Bigger Pockets boot camp. I was in that class. Awesome. Nice. Yes, I was in like, I don't know, what, four or five of them. I thought it was a, a lot of fun. Um, it was a 12 week course. Each week covered a different topic. You had Ashley Care that would cover a topic. She would come and talk in the different groups. And then there was teaching assistants who had different cohorts of people to do, you know, more one-on-one-ish Zoom type stuff. Uh, I think it was a great experience. Zero to hero. My aunt moved away from Roy. She used to have a horse. I know the area. Yes, every, that's that's where you move to. Where in Roy, you either... You make $200,000 a year and live in Roy and have horses, or you make $30,000 a year and live in Roy and have horses. Like there's a both sets of types of people there. Roberto, howdy. When purchasing a triplex or quadplex, for you to qualify for the loan, do they consider the rents for the units that you will not be occupying? That is a great, um, that is a great question, Roberto. So yes and no. So and all lenders are not built the same. So some will have different criteria today and tomorrow. If you're purchasing to, in, to own or occupy, uh, the number of units can increase the amount that you can qualify to borrow against. Mm -hmm. When you first start and you don't have any rental income on your tax returns, it might be harder to find a lender that's going to take your rental income and consider it on your um, income. Once you have rental income for two years, not only will they consider the rents on the property that you're buying, but the, the rents that you have. And some lenders will have the ac extra criteria on there of um, you have to have three months remaining on leases. So that kind of eliminates short-term rentals. It makes month-to-month -month leases look less attractive. So there's a couple of criteria that can, that can make it a lot easier to get the rental income of what you're buying in your debt-to-income ratio. First, if you have rental income on your tax returns for two years, most lenders are going to actually tell you, you can borrow any amount that you want as long as you can save the down payment. So it kind of eliminates debt-to-income, what's your salary, all that kind of stuff. Second, uh, what kind of leases do you have? Are they at least, are there at least, and they say, they say it just like this, and from different lenders, so I know they've been to a class. On the majority of your leases, is there more than three months remaining? So 51% of your leases have to have at least three months remaining on the leases. So yes, they'll consider that if you meet those two criteria. Some will do it on the first one. I, I was buying a duplex and they took the rent from the other side and the rent from the house I was renting out in my debt to income ratio to fix that. So that's if you're owner occupying and you're doing house hacking. If you're buying it as an investment, you have asset-based lending, DSCR loans, you can go above four plexes, you can do all those kind of loans. So it's a very different structure where they're not going to look at your income, your debt to income ratio. It's not even a factor. They do look at your credit score, but they um, will consider the rents in it and they will go off of sometimes what's on existing leases, which can make it very hard. They will go off of, um, Mike and I were looking, Millennial Mike and I were looking at a property together that was a fiveplex, which we didn't want to do lending because it wasn't uh, like 70% or 50% rented out. So the, the, the lenders were looking at, had to have a certain current rented out units. So we were going to look at a cash deal. Um, so it's like all these different ways of looking what you're trying to do, depending on the lender, depending on your area, depending on your background, you know, how long have you been investing? What do your tax returns look like? Um, so, and then you followed, will not be occupying. Sorry, I missed that. Oh, so yeah, the units you will not be occupying. So you're looking at the house hack. So lender shop for the ones who will look at it because not all of them will. And it changes every month to month. And then Millennial Mike diming me out. All Nighter Hider. Dividend Dave. 
Exactly. Because they're all diamond meow. Roy has population of like three people. There is a sign. You can see the now entering and now exiting signs of Roy. It's, it's amazing. Bigger than McKenna, where my duplex is. Do I have anything in Roy? No, I don't have anything in Roy right now. Roy is where the rodeo happens, though. So there is like a two week period there where college, okay, Millennial Mike, college is a scam. You know this. Love you, buddy. <laughs> nice. Foot ahead to freedom. Howdy. How much cash on cash return do you aim for? So my goal is to find what is area average. And when I was investing, uh, starting out, I wanted single family and I couldn't find any cash flow. There was no cash on cash return. Still haven't seen one. So I went to small multifamily and 80% of the deals lose money, 20% make money. And out of those 20%, I was able to find some that would do six to 8% kind of consistently. So I shot for 10%. 10% was my goal. As rates go up, as prices stay high, that yield is harder and harder to find. So if average started to be, I could find five to sevens, I might start looking for an eight. So I'm looking at what is average in my area looking constantly to find out what that is because it's not a stable it's not a stationary target it's, it's moving and then try to beat it i'm still currently right now looking for a 10 um i uh, weirdly found a single family house that i'm looking for but it would be then split level built out to get the yield i'm looking at uh so we'll see how that goes and then i want to make sure i'm not missing any i see patrick became a member howdy welcome to the group we have cookies. And Phil, with a super chat, done with work and two times catching up now. <laughs> uh, on my longer live streams, I tend to do a little better, but on my shorter ones where I'm trying to cram all the information into 17 minutes or less, because that's how long my uh, Sands of Iwo Jima timer lasts, people tell me I talk too fast. I wonder what that sounds like on double speed. <laughs> I'm going to have to go back and check out a video. So thanks for the super chat, Phil. Still looking forward to our call. We will get our schedules to line up. Um, that will be definitely fun. Uh, thank you. Float ahead to freedom. Zero to hero. That 21-year-old friend of mine that makes 120000 I would say if he got debt, it would be worth it this four-day work week. Maybe. You can make 120000 a year driving a truck, too, but it ain't going to be a four-day work week. With no debt, though. MK, what do you think of old historic houses that legally get turned into six unit apartments? Thanks so much. So if it's a historical place, it means, so I would wanna lo learn your local areas. That would be the most important to me. Is it in a historical area where any upgrades or changes have to be approved and met, meet a certain standard that can be a barrier for some people? Was it done legally? If it was done legally and it's historic protected so that which means you couldn't demolish it. And if, find find out what the, the requirements are for your, munis your municipality. If, if it burns down, what would it take to replace it? Um, that's a that's tricky because it's so based on the area and what they call what they mean by historic. Uh, I was making offers in a town called Centralia that had a huge house that was turned into a 10 unit and it was legally done. It was permitted. Um, I ended up not going with it because it was, I, I still self managed and it was outside of my driving distance and tries just a bit too far away for me to drive comfortably and handle a property. But I did look at it, I did consider it, it was on my search. Um, so, depends on the definition of historic in that area and what kind of barriers that puts in place. Amanda, howdy. It's funny, I actually know an Amanda Turner. How do you handle annual maintenance items such as gutter cleaning? <laughs> <laughs> roof inspections, winter weatherization, and other things that tenants are not responsible for. Send a handyman, go out once a year. Yes. So for most of those items, I have a handyman and I tell them, these are, these are the things I want you to do. Uh, I laughed because recently um, being retired, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm way more lazy than I, I think I let people know, but I have gone one time and cleaned off a roof that had moss on it and gutters full and uh, basically filled the back of my truck with trash bags full of stuff from the roof and then went and cleaned the gutters out for another tenant. So I'd done it twice myself this year, which I never, I don't ever do that kind of stuff. Um, painted a ceiling that I would normally have the handyman do. Uh, so not once a year, um, some gutters in our area, they 
they don't need cleaned. Uh, most of them I have the zero clearance thing that comes out up from under the, the shingles I or whatever it's called because not a construction guy. Millennial Mike would know, Lumberjack would know what it is, but it, it basically makes it to where nothing gets in there. Um, if I have trees close, so you'll get pine needle build up here, then I'll have handyman go up once a year because what you'll have here in a, in a high water state is you have vents on your roof for, you know, for uh, fans or, or uh, dryer vents or anything like that. Pine needles will pile up on top and make a puddle. And as the water builds up in that puddle, it'll go under the shingle uh, above it and you'll get a leak. You literally go up and you wipe off the pine needles and you save yourself a $250 roof repair. Um, so that I have that done. Um, make sure that if you're having a handyman do that, that they have uh, roof insurance so that they can go above eight feet uh, of distance from the ground. It's a specialty kind of insurance for anything that's going to go that high. Um, and if using a contractor, same thing, especially if you hire a roofer, actually go to your state's insurance website, make sure that their insurance is recorded the right way, because some roofing companies will get contractor's insurance, which doesn't cover above eight feet. And that puts you in a bind. <laughs> All right. Howdy, REI stoners. Tom, join the military and get a GI Bill. Or join the military and not get the GI Bill. Not everybody gets it. They might now. They might have changed it. Back in the dinosaur day, you had to also pay for the GI Bill when you went in. Hey, hey, it's Timo. Hey, it's Timo. Howdy. Currently going through a separation. Congratulations. Should I sell my single family home, keep it or buy a multi? The 3.15% interest makes me think twice. Currently have $45,000 equity, bought it two years ago. So if you're going through a separation, um, don't answer these questions, but these are these are things I would think about. Separation from a relationship or separation from a marriage? And I said, congratulations, because a separation doesn't mean that a good relationship is ending. It means a bad one is. So congratulations on that. Are they on the lease? Are they also there? Because they're going to be entitled to half the equity. So what I had to do, this is fun. I'm so happy to share this. Uh, like I said, I found out about all the bad debt in my name, but I also owned a house and uh, paid... 98,000 wrapped the closing into it. So I paid 104,000 for the house because I bought it for zero down an adjustable rate mortgage around 2000. So literally one of the causes of the housing crash in 2008, um, but around 2003, 2004, going through the divorce, refinanced the house because home prices had gone up. And so we had about $50,000 in equity. So I had to pull out equity to give her half, even though she created all that debt that was in my name that I didn't know about. That was fun. So that could be a part of your situation. You're going through a separation. Um, you know, how long have you been together? Were you married? What was the basis of the relationship? How much of the equity they're entitled to? You might have to refinance to give them part of the thing, or you could sell to give them. I kept it. I kept it because, well, you bought it about two years ago. Your interest rate now is is the asset. If you sell it and you move, where are you going to buy for that price with that rate? Right. You're not going to get both of those. Um, could you? Turn it into a rental. Could you start house hacking now that you're not there with a partner? Um, could you live there and not do any of those things and keep it, but give them their equity? Um, I am not a fan of selling. I think buying, I don't, I don't think I've ever met an owner who's really happy that they sold something. You know, Zuber was talking about Mike from one rental at a time that last year he flipped in the last couple of years, 56 houses. And he says, I wish I kept every single one of them. Um, I'm renting by the room until divorce is finalized. So divorce will crash. Next comment. Awesome. So there you go. That was my thoughts. Amanda, when learning area average rents, do you have the same process and spreadsheet as analysis to buy a box as a buy box and calculating yield to learn a market? So no, area average rents takes about two weeks to calculate. I have the same process, but I don't have a spreadsheet. I... Um, well, it is a spreadsheet, I guess. It's, it's just not the same as the, the buy box for spreadsheet where I would put in the property, have it listed six times and say, here's the down payment on all the same. And then here's the interest rate, change the interest rate to see what the yield is, change the down payment to see what the yield is. Like compare all six of the same property to each other. Like that's a bigger process for buying than for renting. For renting, it's here's the number of bedrooms. Uh, here's the address. Here's uh, when I looked and what it was listed at. 
and then if it went up or down or if it rented so it's like four columns and it's more of like a scratch paper note thing than a, than a spreadsheet because it's done on, i don't even have that on computer i just have a spreadsheet here when i'm learning rents because i only have to learn rents um for tenant turnovers very rarely but when i'm doing a buy i don't have to know the rents for area area average everywhere i want to know that market because i invest in two counties so if i start looking at a property and decide okay i'm going to do a deeper dive on this one that's when i start looking at the rents in that area um and i'll i will make an offer get it accepted and be calculating rents to make sure the yield is as good as i think it's going to be while it's under contract because you have that inspection period to then realize halfway through oh wow i really am off on this or they went down which i've never seen or, or something that you learn later that changes it and you can pull out without learn, losing your earnest money um so calculating rents is a lot simpler than calculating yield um and um because each property is so unique but rents for an area it's kind of like insurance for an area i don't call the first couple of properties I called every single time and I got a couple of quotes on a property to figure out exactly what the insurance would be. Now I know a single family house in my area, it's going to cost this much for insurance. Duplex in my area, this much. And then the higher, more expensive the property is, the more square footage, the more cost to replace the building, the more insurance might cost. Um, soft numbers on that. And I always pad a little high. Rents always pad a little low. Um, so it's not as involved, but yes if you count writing on a piece of paper in column format there's a spreadsheet hey it's neat i'm trying to get your name hey it's steamo <laughs> i'm probably saying it wrong mortgage is 1600 two rooms 750 each so you're getting 1500 and you live there so you're paying 100 dollars while you're living there it's not a bad house hack especially if you can make it work you know uh, relationship managing with roommates kenny a Getting my CDL has been life-changing income, allowed me to accelerate my savings rate and real estate investing. Two years and over 100,000 home daily. Yeah. <clears throat> I worked as a CDL driver in the 90s and, and early 2000s. Um, I don't think I ever made more than 40 grand. Like I was just stupid. I was going for, I, I lived in a small town and there was like a dairy farm close by and I just drove for the dairy farm. And I was like this, I'm home all the time. I, my kids can come to the dairy farm. The dairy farm had a pool. You had to take your kids to the pool. Like it was, it was a family experience, but I wasn't making any money. Then I realized that there's local LTL companies that pay six figures for you to sit in a truck and listen to the radio. And it was like, what the freak am I doing? We learn things late sometimes. REI stoners, who do you bank with? Can you talk about how you feel about online only banks and their higher interest rates for saving accounts? I understand they save money by not having locations. So I think Graham Stephan really talks about online banking and it's more, I, I think it's a generational thing. Um, boomers probably want the brick and mortar. Gen X is right in the, we, we, we grew up with brick and mortar, but we're starting to see online might work. And millennials was like, yeah, it's, it's on my phone. Why would I want a bank to go into? Right. It's like totally makes sense. That's an age thing. The older you are, the more likely you are going to want brick and mortar buildings to go into. And the younger you are, the more likely you are to be okay with money transacting Apple pay on your phone or on the bank online. So my experience with online banks like Ally is yes, you can get a better savings rate on your 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 money in your savings account, but it, there's going to be a delay on getting money out up to two to three days. Whereas you can go into, I use Bank of America for banking. Um, I started with Wells Fargo for lending and then Fairway Mortgage started beating them. So I shifted. But I, the reason I like Bank of America is their, uh, or, or the larger bank. So Wells Fargo, Chase, Bank of America, over credit union or local bank is their online presence is stronger, but they still have locations. So I could travel to Thailand and use a Bank of America ATM, right? And, have, and I could go all over the United States and have buildings I could walk into and transact. I don't get the money on the entrance rate that you can get in a savings with an online. So maybe if you had money that you didn't think you would ever need in less than two or three days, yes. Uh, make sure it's FDIC insured. If you get above 250,000 in there, make sure it's got that other insurance that, that Lumberjack talks about where the bank pays an insurance. So make sure it's a legitimate company. Uh, I think it's a great idea. It's probably something I'm going to look into. I've always kind of had the mentality until recently that I don't want a good return on the money that I'm saving for the next deal. Because if I'm getting four or 5% on a savings account, 
I'm not going to be motivated to go out and get the eight or 10% rental that takes more work, that takes a bunch of hoops to jump through to get it set up and has another tenant to manage. Um, I like, and because that, that's how, what we see, we see the cash flow, we see the work. What we don't see is the appreciation, the principal pay down, the tax benefits, like all the things that are, that are there that are real, that we know are real, but we're not seeing them as much. So I kind of liked having a low interest savings account where the back of my brain, the, the lizard brain was scratching me every day going, you need to put this money to work. You're losing money every day to in, in inflation, which you still are even at 4% interest on a savings account. But you have reserves. You need to have that there. Reserves that you're going to use, I'd probably split it you know, use a, use a brick and mortar that you can go into, get cash uh, or, or pay somebody quicker and then have your online ally savings account where you're okay with the delay that it takes. And maybe that's getting better. That was just my experience like a year ago. Good question. And I see that Matt is in the comments. Thank you, Lumberjack. I appreciate that. Give this super handsome man a like. He's earned it. No angels died in the making of the super chat and no one retired either. <laughs> well, you paid $5. I read it out loud. Got it exactly how you worded it. I um, appreciate that. I do appreciate the likes. We are at about a 50% ratio right now. That's cool. That's, that's better than uh, not. Uh, thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. And then I missed, uh, so I got Phil's super chat and then I missed Derek's. Howdy, Derek. Thank you for the super chat. And howdy, Matt. How often do you shop insurance on rentals? When I buy a rental, I do a price comparison. So first year, every time. I don't ever just call my agent and say, here's the address. Give me a policy. I, I price shop at that time. And then probably every two to three years. So not quite every year. Once or twice, I'll let it renew. And then I'll go back and I'll say, look, and I don't just Let's go my whole portfolio. I, just, I, I look at, and I want a price quote from your underwriter. I'm getting a price quote from someone else. I want you to know. Tell me what your best rates are because I'm going to get a rate from them. And if there's better, buy into, you know, a significant degree, you know, two or three percent cheaper for me for the same coverage, you're going to lose my business probably every two to three years. A lot of people get homeowner's insurance and then never think about it again. And they go, my homeowner's insurance doubled. Well, no scream and eagle dookie. They had no motivation to keep your business. Yeah, it's a Marine Corps term, by the way, screaming eagle. <laughs> so that's a that's a good question, Derek. Um, and actually, I'm coming up on a year where I'm probably going to do that because I didn't do it in 21 and or 20. So I'm 19 was the last time I did portfolio wide. Like I'm going to compare you like a contractor. Um, so it's, it's coming up on that time again. Zero to hero. I stopped adding to my 401k. My goal is to have lots of cash producing real estate and a great accountant. Two great goals. Um, there was a period of time, zero, where I maxed out um, 401k. Like it was like 600 bucks a paycheck or whatever it was to get the max that you could do per year because I wanted to avoid not realizing I was just delaying and paying more in taxes on a retirement account for later. Um, and then I realized real estate has a better return, more control, pays me now, don't have to retire later. I have like all the benefits that I want and I'm going to be on the list of people benefiting from using my income. I still contributed for the match, right? I dropped my contribution down to what my company would match to get that free money and the little bit of tax delay, which I'm going to pay in January when I take the money out and a 10% penalty. Um, so... If you can get a match, maybe just consider that. And then, so here. Pip, howdy. Haven't seen you in a while. Glad you're back. Or you've just been quiet in the background. Thank you for the super chat. I appreciate it. What is your advice on learning a new market that you have never lived or been in? Um. One of the things I always suggest about, you know, how to pick a market is where do you have trusted boots on the ground? Either you live there, you used to live there, or you know somebody who lives there that trusts you, right? So so if we take that all off the market, you now off the, the chessboard, you, you don't live there, you never used to live there, maybe you don't know anybody who lives there that you trust. How would you learn a market? Zuber says, if you're not willing to fly there, probably not a market you'd, you'd want to invest in. I would, with social media, get in, involved in some local real estate groups, find out some masterminds, kind of like if you were going to invest in Washington State, I would check out 
Seattle Investors Club. Now there's people from all over the country that are in it, but every Thursday at 1130 a.m. there's a mastermind group. You know, there's no cost to be in that mastermind. If you want to watch the replays or be a part of their community, there's an annual cost. But to be in that mastermind, it's free. Just seattleinvestorsclub.com and go to their mastermind. Talk with investors in your area. Find people who are investing where you want to invest. So that market, I wouldn't call and say, hello, Indiana, I have California money and I would like to invest in your town because they're going to send you a deal that looks amazing that every local investor passed on for a good reason that you'll never know until you own it and you lose a bunch of money. So get involved with local investors, build that network. Um, Zuber says, and I agree, if you can't take the time to go and learn a market, look look and go, okay, where the, is the scariest neighborhood? Talk to the cops. You know, where's, where's the part of this town that you guys don't go to alone? Like you take somebody with you if you go there. Um, kind of mentally draw that out, learn, learn the markets. Um, picking one would be hard because there's so much weird data. Are you going to follow, you know, um, population trends? Are you just looking at U-Haul? Where's all your trucks going? Are you looking at... Um, what economic drivers are changing? So if you find out there's a couple of Amazon terminals going in and Boeing's putting in a terminal and Lockheed Mark and it's putting a thing and you think, okay, this place, or they're going to put in a whole town next to Phoenix where they build a chip manufacturing city and you have some foreknowledge, you might go, okay, this might be an area that I'm going to look at. So you might find reasons to pick an area, but developing the relationships with local investors, I think is the key thing to finding out what works and doesn't work in an area. Because while most investors might go, other investors are my competition. You might find people like us who are sharing, who are saying, here's the agents I use. Here's the area that I look. Here's the criteria that I look. We're not competition, right? They're not, you don't have billions of dollars to buy every property that's going to pop up in front of me in my area. I'm going to help you buy a couple and I'm going to get one. I only need one every other year or so. Find an investor that's like that, that will share the information from that area. And then... Uh, pre-screen property management, they'll do the same thing. If they're going to manage the property, because you're in looking at a distance, where would you like me to not buy because you can't manage there because it's a bad area to own in, right? Those are questions I would start with. So that's a, it's a good question. Um, I would wonder why, why pick a place you've never been? Unless you do know of some economic drivers that are changing that make it look like an attractive market, then sure, then that's the process I would start with. Start with investors, property management, maybe go there, spend some time. That's what I would do. Angelina, how do you mentally get through the first five years of investing? <laughs> this sentence, and I say it at the end of about 50% of my videos. You are going to be alive in five years, start investing like it, right? So at the five-year mark, all of a sudden, you're going to have cash flow from assets that don't take very much work. It's only five years, right? 20 years for a pension sounds great when you join the military. Law enforcement, firefighters, teacher, 20-year commitment for a pension. Five-year commitment of here's what I did. I continued to work the same job. I continued to work overtime. I continued to try to develop side hustles. In two years, I purchased one duplex. So I learned to market, learned how to make offers, uh, learned how to calculate rents, learned how to set up multiple searches. Like I did a few things, but what did I actually do? I made a few offers on rentals until I bought the duplex. And then I was back into saving for another two years. So how do you mentally get through those first five years? You're going to have the same five years no matter what right? You're going to live the next five years. Um, if you do one thing every six months or a year on making offers, buying a property while you continue to save, work on credit score, talk to lenders to find out what your options are, like do all of the basics as you're going. It's actually, to me, it was, it was very simple. Like the hard part was not taking vacation and just thinking, okay, I'm, I'm not going to never take vacations. I'm just going to take five years where I don't take vacations. The hard part was don't get a brand new nice car because I've got a cash flowing asset because later the cash flowing asset will buy the car. But right now that cash flowing asset needs to buy the next cash flowing asset. So it, that delayed gratification is, is a real thing. But um, think of these two words. It's not that you're going to have to be frugal forever. It's not that you have to always avoid spending, always <clears throat> ride your bike to work or drive an older car, whatever. It's just for now, just today. But not today. But not today. I'm gonna. Uh, today I'm not gonna take a vacation. Today I'm not gonna buy the new car. 
in five years or seven years. Some people might do it faster. I mean, it took five years because for those first four years, I was also tackling my worst debt, right? The biggest mistake a lot of people make with that, which was at the beginning of this video, is it's not that you don't understand good and bad debt. It's not that you don't focus on paying off debt. It's that we don't start investing until our debt is paid off. A lot of people think I'm going to pay off all this bad debt and then I'm going to save to invest. And that's a huge mistake. I took half my saving rate towards taking care of worse debt, which is adjustable rate, interest above 6%, and not on an asset, it was on a liabilities. And then the other 50% went toward buying cash flowing assets. Once you hit the income snowball, and then you just take all that income snowball and kill all of the bad debt, it goes a lot easier. So it's not going to be easy. It's going to be simple, Angelina. Sierra? We're using the 401k as reserves for loan qualification so we don't have to liquidate it, at least a way to use it for now, the time being. It's absolutely, it's a great use of a retirement account. I've done that once when I bought my fourplex. It literally took my, my cash, my reserves, and my checking down to like 200 bucks. So I had a $17,000 credit card and I had my retirement account before COVID, just at the beginning of COVID, um, when uh, they hadn't let me take it out yet. So I used my retirement account as a reserve as well. It's a great use for it. It is an actual use for it. And I'm not saying empty it out and put it to work. Maybe drop to the match and contribute more towards your investing funds so you can invest faster. You don't have to take money out of 401k. You don't have to borrow against it. It's an option a lot of people do, but using it as a reserve is a great use for retirement accounts. Buddies, howdy. And then my chat moved, sorry. Rob, okay, where's the cookies? Love that. Um, my chat moved a lot, which is good. Okay, dividend day. I'd take offense to that CPA remark if I was one, exactly. Rob, Dion, howdy, Rob. Since you are lazy, very, uh, Want less unit? Does it? Does that mean you won't be participating in the multi-unit price dislocation in the next couple of years that Zuber is expecting? It does. Yes, um, and the debt. So Zuber has a portfolio of the size where he could shift into um, multifamily and either pay cash, you know, maybe find seller financing, but. Uh, or, you know, do a loan assumption, but he's comfortable with part of his portfolio being um, adjustable rate or having a loan revaluation period or all of those things that stop me from going into multifamily. I'm going to be looking up to eight units because of fixed rate debt. So uh, convoy home loans and maybe velocity mortgage. I'm not sure what the way I know that convoy home loans has fixed rate debt on up to eight units. You do pay about a half a percent more. So there's a little bit of a cost to it, but it's not adjustable rate. doesn't have a loan revaluation period. So I will be looking for those. Um, and you're right. I might sell off some pay off debt. That's something that I've talked about. It's not something I'm actually planning on doing. I talk about it because I want to see what my reaction is to having that conversation. So here's something that I got from my sister, um, passed away in the nineties, but this is something that always stuck with me. The inside of your head is round. Your thoughts are going to spin in circles. You need to talk to someone else for your thoughts to make sense. So sometimes I talk about things where, I had, um, I literally made a YouTube channel and got to 10,000 subscribers. So Millennial Mike or Lumberjack Landlord and Zuber would have a conversation with me where we did a video talking about what my options were. Just before I retired, I was like, hey, here's my portfolio. This is how many properties I have. This is how much debt I have. This is, what would you do? <laughs> got both their opinions and then use that to help me retire, right? The whole reason to make a YouTube channel is so that you can talk to people who are doing what you want to do. I'll probably keep adding units. The, the money piles up, right? I'm, 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 I'm at the 4X rule. So doing everything I want and, and then doubling it and doing more than what I want and taking trips and doing these things and doing the side-by-sides and the sea dues and the cruises and all that kind of stuff. I'll probably just, I'll keep hunting. When those two things line up that I talked about at the beginning of the video, when I have the money and the great deal pops up, I will continue to dollar cost average real estate. So those two things are how I dollar cost average. When I have the down payment, closing costs, immediate repairs, and reserves, and I find the great deal, I'm going to buy it. Because it's two hours a month to self-manage 16 rentals, uh, probably a little bit less these last couple of months. I have no idea why, but there's been like three text messages total across the board. So, so either it's all building up and it's all just going to fall right on Christmas Day, or <laughs> my systems are working, which is more likely. 
uh, I'll, I'll continue to add, and I don't know that I'll even notice. I mean, the cash flow will be better, but I don't know that I'll notice the extra work. Tom, are you bored yet? Have you found a routine? Um, I'm not bored. I've never been bored in my life. There's there's too many things to do to ever be bored. Um, and I can't put into words why I'm trying to drag so many of you kicking and screaming into financial freedom. The entire world is different. There is no such thing as Monday through Friday. We make jokes. Every day is Saturday. Every Friday night. Every night is Friday night. But the only way I know that today is Tuesday is that this is a long live stream. <laughs> like the, every day is a vacation day without a ticking timer. There's no return date. And I haven't figured out how to spend money. I had to spend more money yet because no matter what I'm trying, at the end of the month, there's more money in the accounts than when the month started. Why are more people doing this? Is mind bottling, you know, like all your thoughts trapped in a bottle. Um, have I found a routine? No, every day is totally different. Um, the routine, I guess, is my live stream on Tuesdays. Um, the three amigos Tuesday mornings. It feels like my routine right now is trying to figure out which one of my friends isn't working on that day to do something if I want to do something with somebody. But most people are working. And then Dividend Dave took back a message to make me lose sleep and wonder forever and ever what was there. Dividend Dave. I saw a return where the person had mortgage interest deduction paid of 6.3 million. Whoops. Eventually, imagine how much it sucks to eventually make so much money that you have to pay taxes. We don't want to, but at that point, you're making so much money, you're paying taxes. It's not really a problem. Lauren, I only contribute up to the match. There you go. The rest will be going to high quality dividend stocks. Great. Awesome. I love that. And then here I put my thing in. So every member after this, I'll count through when I roll the dice of doom. But let me start here really quick. Schuler, howdy. What's the best way to fund a rehab when the property is fully paid for? Should I get a loan? So you need a rehab and it's paid off, which did you make the mistake of paying off the debt instead of building the reserves to have the money for the rehab? Because that would be a huge mistake. I mean, not the biggest mistake, like this video is titled, but it's a big mistake to pay off debt and not build reserves to do the, the rehab. The tenants should, if it was a rental, should have been giving you gross rents. Portion of gross rents was going into an account to build up that account to be able to handle all of the rehabs, new roof, whatever that was coming up. So if you haven't been doing that, or you somehow bought it all cash and just purchased it, uh, if you take out a loan, it's going to cost you interest on that. Interest rates right now are kind of high. Uh, so home equity line of credit, some might be fixed rate, but they're fixed rate for a period of time. Everybody always tells me, oh, that's a fixed rate yeah, but for 10 years. So can you pay it off in 10 years or less? Um, are you owner occupying? Is there carrying costs while the rehab is happening? Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of things to consider there with that kind of question. Uh, my goal would always be I've recycled cash flow not capital. If you recycle capital, you will grow a portfolio faster. So you, 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 you know, if you took out a loan, you get the rehab done without having to save the money, which should have been coming from the rents. But if you weren't renting because you were living there or whatever the reason was why you paid it off, um, you chose to pay off the debt instead of creating the reserves that would now pay for the rehab. That was a choice. Um, if you take out the debt, now you're adding interest to it. So uh, the interest that you think you're saving on the loan that could have been refinanced earlier at a really low rate, you're not going to be getting at a six or 7% rate, which is not great. Um, if you could do it without the loan, I would, but if you need to get the loan, that is now your cost to acquire. Is it going to cash flow? Is, and, and make sure you calculate all of the costs from the rehab, the holding costs for the months where the rehab's being done that you're not collecting rent, but you still have expenses going out. Um, yeah, that's, that's kind of a hard choice to, to make without all the details. Um, if you send me my emails right there above your comment, if you send me an email kind of detailing some things, I, you don't have to give me the address or anything like that. I'll tell you what I think in, in kind of writing. So I could say, how much is the rehab? How long is it going to take? Um, what's the property worth? What what are rents in the area? Let's all kind of run through the numbers and see if it would make sense. 
Michelle, sure, I would love to. Awesome, perfect. Thank you. Scott, will you buy your million dollar fourplex in Nevada and then you can have no state income tax and you can do your show from the strip? That's not a bad idea. Um, I don't like the idea and I'm not good at making memes, but there was a really good reel that I saw not too long ago, to use a five-year-old term. Um, but you had the lake in Las Vegas. And as Las Vegas grew, the lake shrunk. And eventually Las Vegas is going to be there and there's going to be no lake. So Colorado has talked about not renewing their giving water to Vegas. Um, so at some point, water is going to be a real issue out there. I don't know that I want to buy there right now. But I do like the idea of buying something that's a house hack in another area that would cash flow and then using it as a place to go to get out of the winter up here, with the, which in California is uh, not great. But not long. No, it's not like three months of like you'll die if you're outside. But it's just, yeah, it's cold and wet. And let's see if videos on the strip even make sense because uh, we'll be down there um, in January and me and Matt. And maybe Mike will be doing some videos if Mike can make it um, on the strip or at the range. I'm not sure. <laughs> One of them. Okay, so we've got so the members here, and I'm going to roll, and then I'm going to count down. This is to give away an hour, um, no, 55 minutes, so it doesn't cost you 5000 It's free. Uh, call, and it's loud, so cover your ears for a second. 14. We'll see if we can get to 14. Um, and it's of members. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Tom, you cheated. You're on there twice. So I think there was only six. I need to use a different dice. So before we quit down there. Okay. So let me go back up. 14 was too big. I have a six sided dice. You can't call yourself a nerd if you don't have a bag full of metal dice that glow in the dark. Um, I don't know why some of them are pink, though. How did that happen? Got green. So let me make sure how many comments there were here from members. One, two, three, four, six. Seven, eight. Okay, eight. So just in case you didn't know, there's an actual eight-sided dice. Eight. Ironic. Okay, so started here. Tiffany White. So I'm going to write that down. Tiffany, my email's right there. If you could send me, we will get that set up. Cool. And I appreciate people sharing their freedom numbers. And, and I like that you could tell people are here. Uh, it wasn't like $10 million, $20 million. It was this much a month. That's the freedom number. How much money coming in every month passively that you don't have to sell your life for one hour at a time. So let me go through these comments really quick. Freedom numbers are good. I love it. Sierra took theirs back to make me wonder forever and ever what was going on there. Thank you, Nancy. Howdy. Useful information. Um, well, my two-sided die. So Tom knew. I, uh, do I have it? I don't have a two-sided now. I used to. Four is the smallest. Price and pride. Howdy. Unless people start voting for higher taxes and restructuring the corrupt healthcare system, my freedom number is, oh, I love it. That's a good answer. 10000 a month. Medical wasn't an issue, then I'd be half that. Medical is a problem. Grizz, howdy. If my first property takes two years of showing up on my tax returns before that income can be used for new loans, 
How long does my second property take? That's a great question, and I hope this answer helps. As soon as you have rental income on your tax returns, it's not the properties. It's now you're a vetted property owner that's a landlord. So the second one is the day you close on it. They'll actually look at the income from it as you're buying it in your debt to income ratio. So it's just those first two years are the hardest. The idea is they don't want you to scale so fast that you make all those mistakes in the first couple of years that most of us tend to make. They want you to prove that in those two years, you can actually run this and they take depreciation out. So it looks like, even though it looks like you're losing money, you um, take depreciation out, you should be making money. It, so great question. Once you get past those two years, it's like the clouds part, the rays of sunshine come down and the lender actually said these words, you can buy anything you want if you can save the down payment for it. Um, and I'm sure that that's not like factually how it was, but that's how they said it. And, and to, to make me go, okay, I, I take away the price limitations because the more expensive the property, if I'm buying it right, more the rent should be on that property. And then trouble force, uh, you make a good point here, 12,000 per month adjusted annually for inflation that shouldn't be covered by growth of cash flow from investments. Correct. Uh, and so maybe dividend stocks will do that. I, I don't know that people felt that when at and cut theirs in half, but there are people who grow dividend portfolio stocks um, or use the 25% rule, but with real estate, mortgages go up a little, You know, insurance and taxes changes, rents tend to go up a lot. Now they can be flat in a few years, but since we've started tracking the data, you guys have all heard it. Rents have never once gone down market-wide. So they can be flat, but they do tend to, in a five-year period, they're always going up. Uh, that's where cash flow covers. And I think um, David Green from Bigger Pockets gets this great. If you need $5,000 a month, that doesn't mean you get to $5,000 a month and retire. Like you need a buffer. So I use the 4X rule. I needed it around 4000 a month. So when it got to 16000 a month, it actually felt kind of silly going to work every day. It's even higher than that now. Um, yeah, so adjusted for inflation by investing in an asset that is actually benefiting from inflation. And Patrick, welcome. Thank you. Tiffany, my numbers have changed significantly because I recently moved into my small rental condo and decided to rent out my house that is a larger property. Brilliant strategy. Love it. And it isn't forever. It's for now, right? Which is not today. You're not going to live in the bigger house today. As that improved your finances, you're going to be able to make choices that in, in a few years, if not already, is going to make life a lot better. Peter also took a message back to make me sleep and wonder forever and ever. Does anyone in here manage rentals in California? How's the experience? My brother has rentals in Kern County, right on the northern edge of, you know, just outside of LA County, uh, self-manages at a distance. And uh, it's going really well. I would say that a lot of people think, I can't invest because I'm in California and it's an expensive market. Well, California is like 17 countries all packed together. Are you in LA? Are you in Los Angeles City? Are you in one of the bigger cities? Are you out in Fraser Park, right? Are you out in Rosamond? Are you in Fresno or Sacramento? Like there's a big difference just a couple hours away in the same state. Um, so if people have comments in there, that would be great. But my brother uh, owns, and one of the reasons that he self-manages, because he likes to do things legally, which is weird because he's not that kind of person. Every trip he takes to California is a complete tax write-off because he's got three properties there that he self-manages. Phil, work equals shoveling off rental roofs in negative 22. Come visit the no. no I'm going to come and see the Lumberjack Landlord. We're going we're gonna to see each other in Vegas, and I will eventually go um, to his place uh, and hang out and go with throw some axes and just some other stuff that you do around Boston, but not today. Not when it's Siberia. I'll wait for the, you know, the I'm hoping that summer falls on a weekend there so I can go hang out. Angelina, are you using list price to find the area average? No. List price means less than nothing. What did properties sell for? That tells you what area average is. So list price, and also when it comes to list price, that doesn't mean what my offer is going to be. 
uh, when speed was a factor for the last couple of years, I was making offers above asking and asking below asking, depending on what made sense mathematically for me. I wouldn't go significantly low on an offer when it was really new on the market, but I had gone below list. Um, I've gone at list in 2021. I got I got the deal at list and then we negotiated down 2,500. In the beginning of 2020, I closed on a fourplex uh, like January 6th, where I offered $5,000 more and we settled $5,000 less. So was that the math? It was five ninety five. I offered six. We closed at five ninety. So I got basically five thousand off list price. None of that means anything. It would have cash flowed at the at the six that I offered, and I negotiated for better. Um, so it's not list price. And if you're using list price, I don't use Zillow, Redfin, their estimates. It's what did properties close in your area and it's the area average price, which I don't really care about. I'm looking for area average yield. So the price of the property you're looking at versus the rents that you can get, then you calculate what would my annual profit be divided by my cost to acquire. That gives you a percentage. Uh, so it really doesn't matter what the average prices are because houses are going to be different. You, you can look at a three bedroom, two bath here and a three bedroom, two bath here. And while appraisers are going to comp it, that those rents might be significantly different. What if one has a garage and a lot of parking and the other one is right next to a noisy nightclub? Like your rents are going to be very different, different neighborhoods. Um, so it's a great question. I haven't really worried about area average home prices. Like I couldn't tell you the median home price in my area. I have no clue. I have no idea. I know it's higher than it was a couple of years ago. Um, so it's a great question. No. Rob, where are the cookies? It's with the members. You're not a member. That's where the cookies are. Wayne, freedom number, 60,000 a year. So 5,000 a month. Good. It's kind of a round number. So what I would suggest, Wayne, is instead of thinking this is how much I think I would spend and how much I'd like to spend. So right now, so if you're working and you're making $60,000 a year and you think if I retired making $60,000, that would be great. While you're working, you're paying the highest amount of taxes. Earned income is the highest tax. And you're saving for retirement. So that's a significant chunk that's not going to be there. But you might be getting health care from your employer. So you're going to have something like a one to $2,000 bill that starts coming every month. That's your responsibility now instead of the employer's. So there's a couple of things like that to look at. What you can do is look at your last six months of expenses. Look at your credit cards, receipts, bank statements, and say, this is what I actually spent. And for me, even on months where I goofed off, it was really hard to break the 4000 a month point. Uh, so if you had kids and you add that, maybe a car payment or something, and you get to five, that totally could be the, the number. But think, what is it actually? And, and then after you decide that, it really doesn't matter. You have a soft, you might you might even increase it. Uh, you might decrease it, but that's a good number to start with. At least it's not like I need $10 million in the bank, right? But my properties are paid off and so is my personal residence. Cool, right? So not, not like it's a bad choice. We talked earlier, that was a choice that someone made. Um, should be, would take less properties to get that much cash flow if there was no debt. But it, for most people, it would take longer to do it that way. All nighter hider. Finally washing my last bird. If feathers were currency and be Scrooge McDuck. Nice. Wait, by the way, we have the same situation as far as financial infidelity and almost at the exact same time. Awesome. Well, congratulations for surviving that. Make sure I'm not missing any other super chats. Um, Derek, appreciate it again. Howdy, Cody. Tom, if I win the one hour Zoom, can I trade it in for $5,000? Um, since you didn't win, sure. No, that's not how that works. <laughs> good, good try, though. <laughs> and thanks, Phil. Thanks. Not sure it's worth the reverse trade. Lumberjack, diff. Diff is the insurance for the, uh, the banks that, um, can insure more than 250,000. If so, FDIC insurance starts stops at a certain point, diff insurance will insure up to the amount that you have in there or an amount, check with your bank. Matt, are you still planning 45, 6, 14? I'm curious too. I like a bank to get cash out. Yep. Mel, howdy. And that was Julie. Howdy, Julie. Nice, thanks for hanging out with us. You like a bank to get cash out? Yes. 
So a, a bank is not bad. I know that you can do ATM with online banks, but there, there can be a delay for larger amounts. Um, I, I do think that 4% interest on a saving account sounds better than 0.8% that you can get at some of the larger banks now. Um, but Mel, Meldrick, howdy. Does anybody ever get stuck on whether to go the single family or multifamily route when first starting? Uh, that's a great question. My goal was single family. I, I understood it. I lived in, I had a house. I moved into an apartment, rented the house out, thought I'd buy another house, live in it for a year, rinse and repeat, just keep doing that over and over until I got to 10. But houses in my area don't cash flow. So I like the way that Zuber looks at it from one rental at a time. He will buy the property with the best yield. So if he finds a single family that has a 15% return and a duplex that has a 12% return, even though the single family might cost less, might produce less cash flow, it's a better yield. So he'll buy it take less money down payment or whatever. And he's gone where he sold all of his single family and moved into all multifamily just before the 08 crash because he saw the writing on the wall to know how to do that. And you know, he used the affordability index to know to, when to determine when homes were going to get their highest value, right? Or price. So for me, I have a video on my channel called single family versus multifamily. And for me, if it's multifamily, are you talking five units or more? Uh, because for me, the, the killer is loan, the loan product. Uh, most lenders, if it's more than four units, like I said, convoy home loans and maybe Velocity Mortgage, if it'll go up to eight units with fixed rate debt, they want you to have a commercial loan, which means you have a loan revaluation period and adjustable rate mortgage, uh, balloon payments, like weird things that I don't want to ever think about. I want to fire and forget a mortgage. Never have to think about it, but watch rates in case they get lower than where they're at by a significant margin. Then I would refinance to the better rate to improve the cash flow. Um, if it's single family versus small multifamily, now you get the same type of lending as single family with small multifamily. Can you find them in your market? And 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 a lot of people forget the asset of house with ADU. So basically two units like a duplex, but then you get strictly single family lending. So you can do 3% down if it's your first home that you haven't owned uh, conventional. So mortgage insurance goes away when you hit a certain equity point. You can use FHA on all of that across the board. Uh, it really depends on uh, the market you invest in, your lending structure, um, and sometimes the area. I, I know that I wouldn't want to own, I own one that's like this, but I wouldn't want to own more sing, um, small multifamily, so duplex or triplex or fourplex, on a street that's all duplexes. Like most of mine, it goes single family, single family, my duplex, single family, single family, whatever. It's like it's in the middle of of single family houses. And my fourplex is in the middle of single family houses. Uh, I have one duplex that's on a street that was built as a cul-de-sac of duplexes. So it's going to appreciate much less than my du my small multifamily next to single family houses. Um, so I wouldn't want a whole portfolio of that. But if your whole area is that, it's the only option. And the yield is there that you want. It doesn't mean it would stop me. But it's a good question. Um, and then that super chat from Kip. Thank you. Nicholas, what's your renter's insurance policy on your rentals? How much physical injury, et cetera? How much is your umbrella policy after that? Um, don't sue me, bro. First, uh, $300,000 slip fall. So injury coverage on each property. Full replacement value because some insurance policies will let you do the amount of the mortgage. The lender can be made whole, but I want to be made whole too. I just want the whole new building to go up and I keep making the mortgage payment. So full replacement value on the property. Um, I say this. Often I, at three properties, I probably should have got the umbrella, but I didn't until four. Uh, originally, it was $550 a year for $2 million. Now it's like six something. So I have a $2 million umbrella policy above that. And one other thing that you need to know when you get the umbrella is they might require that all of your properties that are in the umbrella be done by the same insurance company, or they could require that only a certain number of them are, and that you have to have different companies covering them. And they're going to require, in some cases they do in mine, you raise the cost coverage on your vehicle. They don't care about the coverage on your vehicle. They care that, um, so a lot of states require that you, if you get into a wreck, up to $25,000 of the other person's car has to be covered or, or a certain amount of money for their injury, right? Your in umbrella policy could require that your car insurance be, at, I think my physical was like 50 and injury was like double whatever the state minimum was. And it was like six bucks a month more. So it wasn't like it was a lot, but it was a requirement that they made another hoop that they make you jump through. So something worth being aware of. Phil, Lumberjack, laughing. 
No one retired either. I hit the like button just for you. Nice. <laughs> That's one more like in the retirement account. I appreciate that. We're almost at an 80% like button now. That's a very high ratio. Um, yeah, appreciate that. We are at two hours and 15 minutes. So if there's still questions, I'm going to keep going. Zero to Hero, do you know of someone who can give a loan without two years of work history, let's say, if I want to change careers? Absolutely. Um, the wanting two years of consistent work history in the same industry is a wish list for lenders. So check with lenders. Don't assume that they're going to say no until they say no. That is generally if you're going to do residential loans in your name. You can do asset-based, non-QM, DSCR-type lens, loans seller financing where your income and your work doesn't matter at all so i would check i have a friend alex who works for certain lending that i connect people with um that does asset-based lending where you know they look at the rent of the property they look at your credit score so you got to have a decent credit score and they can do lending on the property no matter what your job is or what your income is so my email zero is up there you have been here long enough to have seen it so reach out to me i will connect you with alex actually what state are you in? He's in he's in Washington. Um, so if it's out of Washington, I'd probably connect you with Convoy Home Loans because they have product like that too. But if you're around here, that's how I've been doing that. All nighter. Find your true love at ABC. Hit the like button. It works. Absolutely. Look, there's a mirror. No kidding. Way good, Phil. Nice. Tuesday. Patrick. Howdy. And you came in a bit late with that. So I'll give you a better shot next time. But thanks for joining the membership. And so we're going to be, uh, I think that was you that joined, right? Was it was it Patrick? Yep. Um, members only live streams happen on Fridays at 4 p.m. And then they stay up for members after that. So it's not like they go away if you can't make it. We might do some on a weekend sometime coming up. Um, and if anybody isn't aware, there's a reason why I do the members' lives that way. I would I would like to continue to grow my YouTube channel. I want to get this information out to more people. So I appreciate every like and every comment and every super chat and anything that you do that helps me support the channel to get this information out, right? But I also want to share information that you want. The, the person who comes and watches all the time that knows the story, knows from bad financial position to financial freedom in 10 years or less and gets the mental concepts of like my live this weekend, who's using your income? Like those kind of thoughts just help us stay motivated and on track, right? But I also want to share the boring stuff, like the super boring stuff. I want to open an email and go, here's the auto search from my agent. When I look at the property, here's my first thought. Here's what made me do a deeper look. Here's what made me say that's not a good deal at all. Just walk through the whole process of that. If I made that video and put it on YouTube, because the way YouTube works is when you put a video out, you have a thumbnail. So the image, right? You have a click-through rate. However many people it shows to, if it shows it to 10 people and one person looks at it, you have a 10% click-through rate. So if you get a two or three people out of 10 that look at it, it just sends it out to 100. So it ripples out. The more people that click through, the more people it's going to send it to. Then the longer you watch it, the more people it thinks, this is an engaging video that people will watch. So let's send it to more people to watch. So you grow your channel by making videos that people want to watch. If Imagine if you were on YouTube. And you just randomly clicked on a video and you saw somebody opening an email and talking about a rental property and you weren't looking for that content, you'd click out and it would kill the channel. So I made the members only so I can do stuff like that. We can make a binder. We can look at my rental areas, my searches. We can look at your rental areas. We can get on the Zoom and interact like that. And those videos won't kill my content because you can only see them if you're a member. So if you're not a member, it's not gonna, it's not gonna be some random person who found my content, came in. I want them to see the first video to be something like, I wish I had more debt, right? Like that's the video I want someone to see first or should you or should you not have an LLC? I don't want them seeing some old guy opening up his emails. That would kill my channel. Polo, I know you guys always talk about duplex, triplex. I'm from South Florida. Usually those properties are in the hood, right? So if there's areas where there's a bunch, I have a friend who invests in Florida. So North Cape Coral, it's all new builds. A lot of duplexes going in there. It's not the hood. Um, not the best of places. What can I do? So I would look at if 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 you're in an area and, and right and it's lo location, 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 and real estate is very local. If for some reason all the small multifamily was just in bad areas, add that to your search of house with ADU. That that doesn't have an area where it's mostly predominant, right? You're you're going to have that can be in any area. 
numbers work like a duplex lending works better like a single family um but a lot of people say there's none in my area because they're looking for adu and the listing agent is calling it a granny flat or a mother-in-law house or a detached accessory dwelling unit or auxiliary dwelling unit or JADU or all these things, right? So your search has to include every single colloquialism that could be used to define that asset. Um, and don't look on Redfin, don't look on Zillow, have MLS search set up with several different agents sending you them so that you can you can actually get access to most of them. Even if you're an agent with access to the MLS, have other agents have a search set up with you. Um, I've, I've never more than, well, not never. One time in the entire time I've had auto searches set up, had the same agents, different agents send me the same deal in less than 24 hours. And over a period of weeks, yes, I'll see all the deals that are out there. But the first one to send it to me is the one going to be the one that gets the, the work, right? And it's very rare, very rare to ever see the same search from two different agents. Um, so that's what I would do. Michelle, a show from the strip. Will that be on FI? <laughs> yeah, of course. Yes. Let's talk about, here's how you make money in Vegas. It's the same way I make money here in Washington because we have casinos. Eat there. Don't gamble. Don't drink. They have bars. They have casino. They're, they're making money off of gambling and that. So they give great food at a very reasonable price to attract you in. And then don't go for the things that they're actually going to make money off of. That's how you make money in Vegas. Buddies. Howdy. What data would you look at to determine if you should sell the property or continue to keep it as a rental? The, so I've never sold any of mine, but the times that it seems to have made sense for my friends like Lumberjack Landlord or Zuber to sell properties is when they have high turnover. In, in an area where you generally don't have turnover, but that property seems cursed. Like there's something going on there that just the build, the layout, the parking, the area, the neighborhood, something is making people go over and over and they sold it. That, that'd be the thing that I use more so than the math. High turnover creates work, which I don't want, so I'd get rid of it. Um, I don't have that going on, so I haven't. Um, if you're losing money and you get rid of it, you don't get, or if you can't fix that it's losing money, if rents went down in that area, if uh, I don't think so, there's the, the, the like the the number zero when it was created, math changed, right? For a lot of civilizations, I don't think that there's a difference between. If you make $1 and you lose $1, you get rid of the one that's a loss, right? But if you could, like I have a really good cash on cash return on all my properties. Across the board, it's all above 20% now because I've had them for a while, right? Um, and it continues to go up. I have a pretty bad cash on equity return. The amount of equity that I have could create more cash flow if I sold everything, bought everything and got a 10% return. Again, so the cash on equity, I'm not doing great. I'm not going to. My cash on cash is so good. I have financial freedom. I don't need to get more financial freedom. There's not the, you know, once me for me, once I hit the four actual four times financial independence, um, more than that doesn't really matter to me. Um, and and yes, while my kids could inherit more, they're gonna inherit millions. Instead of inheriting a parent that they would have to take care of when I'm old and can't take care of myself, I now have millions to take care of myself that way. Um, and they're not gonna inherit. A person to take care of, they're going to get millions in property. They could get more, so I could grow, but I'm not that motivated. I wanted freedom. I wasn't, and as much as I love my kids, I wasn't investing for them, right? If you if you just get a bunch of millions of dollars in anything, it generally ruins your life. And most of those people go broke within five years and file bankruptcy. So it's not like it's a good thing to give your kids a whole portfolio to do unless they're involved in it and you make a trust and they manage it towards the end. So they actually are ready for it. So that wasn't my goal to do that. I, I was doing it to where they will have an inheritance, um, but that's why I'm not really worried about the debt equity, which seems to break Lumberjack Landlord's brain whenever we talk about having a paid off property that you know is getting like a four or 5% cash on equity return, but a 30 plus percent cash on cash return. Um, Phil. Have you ever, to buddies, have you ever met an investor who didn't regret selling? Great question. That was, I brought that up earlier. Kip, I am moving from Sacramento, California to St. Pete, Tampa area. That's why I don't know the area. All right. So um, what if you don't buy right away? Uh, look, you know, the cost of renting for six months to learn markets, to learn an area might be a, a worthy investment to learn where you would like to own. Learn something like if you're looking at um, Tampa, Florida, 
there's a significant difference in um, insurance for water damage based on the elevation of the house. Uh, and so most new builds are built up four feet before they even start the foundation. And until you know that, like going there and not know, knowing that, that'd be something that can impact your, your insurance costs up to like a thousand dollars a month difference, a month difference in insurance cost. Uh, so I'd be really careful with that. But that's a great clarification. Thank you. And then Mark, howdy. Thank you for joining, uh, but not today. And Long, howdy. Welcome. Thank you for joining. I appreciate it. Uh, you guys are awesome. Um, Cody, with that, appreciate it. Phil, except for Zuber, who was pivoting instead of selling. I mean, exactly. Tiffany, yay, awesome. Look forward to it. Foot ahead to freedom. What interest rate have you been seeing these days on a duplex with excellent credit? Um, it's a little confusing because are you talking the buy down rate? Like I, I since I intend on buying long-term, never plan on investing like I need the rates to go down to refinance and never plan on selling. Uh, I always look at buying down the rate. What I would look at now that's different than last year is last year, I bought down the rate. This year, I would look at the seller buying down the rate as part of the negotiation process. And I, would, I wouldn't start with that, but once we were under contract, I would then add that to it. Um, six to seven, somewhere in there. Call your lender, ask for a quote. Uh, and it changes every couple of weeks. Um, it could change every day, really. And the Fed rate just went up 50 basis points. So we had a, a CPI reading that was a little less than was it was expected. So I would expect lenders to compress rates over the next couple of weeks. So I think we could see a dip in interest rates coming. Um, don't count on it, right? I wouldn't not lock in if you have a right deal right now. Um, but I would watch to see what happens with rates. Um, it's, it's weird. Fed rate went up, so mortgage rates might come down because lending fear is less. So in, they normally have a one and a half to two point spread between you know banks lend on margin. The, the Fed lends them a certain amount and then they lend above that to make the profit and they actually get paid more on the servicing usually. But um, when they're scared, like the last year or so, the, the gap was 4%, right? We had threes you know, two, 3% on mortgage and we had five, 6%. And then it gets all the way up to 4% on the Fed and we dropped to six and it's down to two. So it went up a little, but lending fear is less right now. Uh, so check every week, it can't hurt. Phil, a reason to get wealthy with real estate. Nick, thank you for that. 15 to 20. That's good. That's, that's where mine ended up being. Um, the financial independence number was like 4K. Financial freedom and retire and never worry about it. It's four times that, right? Phil. Sure, provide housing mostly to pay the 5000 for an hour with me, right? Exactly. Agree, Phil. I'd said I'd pay the 5000 once my monthly income is 10 times that. Perfect. I look forward to it. Let's get you there. I'm up Kip to Bill, where you at in Florida, all night or hider. I've worked hard to decrease my expenses and have a four times freedom number of less than 5,000. Interesting. Awesome. That number will increase. So I have a goal of 40 a month passive income in today's dollar value. Good goal. So, Angelina, you need four times of so 16K to retire. You don't need that. That's when it felt silly to continue working. That's that's the number I picked. Um, and and now that I'm, it's really weird. So I don't know if that number's right. Seriously. For four years, I've worked beyond the freedom financial independence number and then hit the 4X number. And all it's really doing different is it's allowing me to continue sit, to save for more assets right? I don't need that. It's just part of it. So two times, three times, it's probably comfortable, especially if you don't plan on buying anymore after that. Um, I don't, and I don't even know that I do plan on it. So I overshot. Mark, how do I become a member? And you figured it out because you found it. I must've mentioned something about me. You might have to change uh, devices. 
And Phil is saying to Angelina, you will get there. Just keep hanging on. And figure out what your number is because it is very specific to the person. Mo Tufer, howdy. I always listen to you. And then my chat moved right when I was talking, which is awesome. I lost my spot. Um, I always listen to you guys on 1.5. Exactly. I, I do that too. You I take in more content. Sometimes though, I listen to someone's podcast and I'll go back, put it on normal and listen to it again. Because um, just the right stuff is talked about. Scott, great news on the bank looking at the second rental and I'll take the sunshine too. Exactly. Phil to Mark. I had to go on the computer to sign up. Thank you. So you guys got to figure that out. Laura. Look in Central North Florida. I lived in South Florida, but I live in South Florida, but my duplex is in Central Florida. Nice. Thank you for that, Laura. Angelina, so if I become a member, you'll send me cookies. They're, they're YouTube has cookies all over your computer right now. <laughs> um, I will send you financial freedom, like through osmosis. All Nighter Hider, real cookies or computer cookies? Ha, see, got me there. I like to tell dad jokes, but since he's dead, he never laughs. Christopher, Phil, I thought I was a member too. Oh, sorry. Nice. Mark, you got it. There, you figured it out. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. Nicholas, why is equity pay down never in the yield calculations? Because it can vanish like it did in 2008. It is not real until you do something with it. And equity pay down means nothing to me. So you have two different versions, uh, two different terms in accounting that you use. Yield is what it produces. And an accountant will include principal pay down in the profit. That when you recall the word term profit, I learned that from Zuber. So if you say profit, they're going to count principal pay down. Can you eat it? Can you eat it without having to cash out refi or sell or HELOC? My cash flow? I can eat it. It's physically in my account every month. The pay down isn't. So if you want to count pay down, you would want to count appreciation. You can calculate what the pay down is, but you can't calculate what if properties lose value. Now that appreciation pay down doesn't mean anything. You've paid off on an asset that's now worth less, right? That's totally possible. That That's the main reason. Um, and, and for me, it's a fictitious number that means nothing. When people ask me about net worth, I didn't know when my net worth passed a million dollars until I was making a video on what happened first, a million dollar net worth or a million dollars in debt. And they actually happened on the same date. When I purchased a property, it created my debt to go over a million and the equity in that property uh, caused my net worth to be over a million too, which meant nothing. What was it doing to my cash flow? That's that's why when we talk yield, it is what is it producing now? Kind of like how Kiyosaki pissed off the whole world in the 90s when he said, the house you live on is not an live in is not an asset because it's taking money out of your pocket. And before that, the, the mantra across all finances was for most Americans, the house is going to be the biggest asset you ever purchased. And then this guy comes out going, it's not an asset, it's a liability because it's costing you money. And that resonated with some people that weren't in finances. In finances, profit includes yield and the principal pay down. But in real estate, is the pay down on your mortgage on the house that you live in yield? No, it's not on a rental either. Uh, so I hope, that, I hope that helps explain because I'm not trying to sound tacky, but that's why it's not. Zero was the matrix a documentary. <laughs> I love the way Elon puts it. It is more likely that we are in a simulation than we are existing at a point where a civilization, civilization comes to the point where they're about to make a, simula a simulation. Probably butchered that. That's why I'm not Elon. All Nighter. My legal counsel says the Matrix was a proxy movie to the straw man argument of the U.S. corporation and all the capital letter names. He's not crazy. There are quite a few parallels. Exactly. Phil, I'm talking parallels, did everybody enjoy Pocahontas in Space 2 that came out this weekend? 
Crazy Like a Fox. All Ladder Hider. And we must be the same age-ish, Phil, if you know Crazy Like a Fox. He is pragmatic, which is totally different from the other sovereignty. And then my chat moves. Um, I, I plan on taking good care of my parents and with a current incentive structure, my kids. Nice. Correct incentive structure. I don't want my kids taking care of me. I saw how they took care of pets. I'm good. And then long for joining. Uh, Cody, what's your next goal in real estate? And for fun, what trip are you looking forward to next year? So this year, I, my plan was Russia. That got changed. Um, Panama and Thailand next year, Vegas beginning of the year in January. Um, my next goal in real estate. Um, I need to get this clip into a couple of videos. If you watch the movie Passengers, Chris Pratt, um, he's on a spaceship with a robot bartender. And the robot bartender is talking to him. And so here's the butchered quote from that movie. That's why I want to get the clip in a video. The bartender says, think about where you want to be. You're not there now. You're on a journey. You're going somewhere. You'd like to be there. It might be financial freedom. It might be a freedom number. It might be a number of units. It might be a certain type of relationship. It might be a location. Where would you like to be? Now, picture yourself there. You've arrived. You, you've achieved that goal. You've gotten there. Most people, they get there and they think, I'd like to be there. They've moved the goalpost. They've said, there's another place I'd like to be. Until you realize how to enjoy where you're at, you're always going to be moving the goalpost. I don't think I have another goal with real estate. I have the right number of units to produce more cash flow than I need to support my life and to continue adding cash flowing units. So I probably will, but it's not a goal. It's just something that is it, the money's got to be put to work somehow. Um, and it's very important not to compare somebody that's at year 10 or 12 with year one to five, right? There was a time where I could only think about growing and adding rentals because it's what I had to do. Once you hit four times your freedom number, three times your freedom number, whatever it is, the goal doesn't have to be real estate goal. My goal right now for real estate is to see how many of you I can get on the property ladder or get further up the property ladder. I think that's my, my goal more than anything for me. Nick, how do I become a number member? Did you figure it out? Let's see. So we might have to change devices some people had to log over on a computer for the little join button to show up laura howdy laura good to see you here um can is correct avoid buying in flood area i am not in a flood area and still play flood insurance yep and it can be significantly different higher if you're in a flood area yep phil i don't know watching a guy opening emails i myself like watching people wash dishes <laughs> nice but there you go what do I like to watch? I don't know. I'll try to watch something that's boring. Nick from All Nighter. You may have to back out of the chat where there's a join button. There you go. I watched All Nighter. I watched dishes. Hi, Amy. Phil. It's silly relaxing, especially if you don't have so many dishes to wash yourself. Exactly. That's the way the cookie crumbles, Stephen and Dave. Exactly. You like to tell dad jokes too. Ever make it to can I hide her? Yes, we took a trip now. You're okay. Here we go. From Bolo. When did you know you could move forward for the next property? Worried if both homes are empty, I could be over leveraged. Thanks. So it's a great concern. Um, it's it's one of the contributing factors to why I like class C rentals. A couple of weeks ago, I did a live stream on why I like class C rentals. And I think the opening intro is going to be coming out on its own separate video here pretty soon. Um, mostly it was because the, and the main reason is the people in a class C rental, if they lose their job, can find another one fairly easy that makes the same amount of money. Whereas somebody that's making $150,000, $200,000 a year, and then all of tech starts to lay off, it's very hard to go out and get a tech job when that industry is laying off kind of hard to replace the income. And then they're generally going to downsize from A to B or B to C, but C is going to stay in C. So that's the kind of the main reason, but a, a tertiary reason is I can handle the mortgage, right? So, so how did I know when I was ready for the other, the next rental, the, the great thing that we have now that didn't exist 2005 to 2008 uh, is lenders, 
right? They're going to want to make sure you have a certain amount of reserves. They're going to make sure that you have a certain debt to income ratio. They're going to, so that's how I knew when I had the reserves to satisfy, satisfy a lender's need. And I had, you know, a stable tenant. That, that's why I don't, I didn't want to in the beginning add two or three rentals a year as I was learning systems. Having no systems and failing at everything I did the first year in real estate with one, I failed so bad I tried to quit, right? I tried to give away the property. Uh, and luckily it was underwater, so I didn't. And that's how I ended up where I'm at. I got stuck with a property. Um, so a little bit slower scaling in the beginning might actually help you. Good reserves, get your systems in place, make sure you have a handyman. Um, and yes, if all of your tenants stop paying, that is going to put most of us in a bind. So the question when we're starting out is, what if I have an empty property? That's always the fear. So here's the way I want to kind of tweak a little bit of part of your brain. I'm pluck out that part that worries about having a vacancy. And think of this. If you have an empty unit, how much might you have to lower the rent, 50, 100, 500, whatever the amount is from what it's at, to get a tenant in there? Whether you would just guarantee it's 20% lower than rent in the area, so they're definitely going to move in. Now you're going to carry two or three hundred dollars a month, right? For for that that worst thing. Instead of thinking I have a whole vacancy that I have to worry about, it's I have to adjust rents temporarily, and 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 so that's kind of the way to look at it. The the real solution to filling a unit when when isn't lowering the rents, right? If that's the way I want you to think about. It, is if I had to lower the rents, how much lower would it have to go to where somebody would definitely move in, right? What you see before you see rents coming down, which lets you know that every content creator out there that's talking about rents dropping is full of dookie because you know I had Dana, the CEO of Hemling, come on here managing 18,500 units with 3,000 owners and not one of them signed a lease at a lower amount than last year, right? People put rents out at a wish list price and then lower it down doesn't mean it came down. It means it didn't go up as much as they were hoping for. Before you see rent decreases in any market, you will see rent concessions. You'll see apartment complexes go, one month free, 50% first month, a concession because they keep rents high. Before you drop rents, you make concessions. Could you handle your mortgage for a month or half of your mortgage for a month to get a tenant in and then have the rents where they need to be? So it's a good concern, but it's the one we all start with. What if I have an empty place and I have to carry it all myself? No. What if I had to pay for a month or half a month or lower my rent just enough to get a person in there? Those are the, the easier concerns to handle. Hope that helps. Great question. Phil. If you ever make it this close to town again in Arkansas, let me know. That's an AK, right? Uh, Saldona, Kenne area, you may have that wanting a multifamily here. Nice. Um, I think we're almost to the end of the questions. Um, let me see if we got any more here. Oliver, howdy. Glad you made it too. Um, Sierra, I am so sad. It's all cash flows with the flood insurance. It's still cash flows with the start of the flood insurance, but um, it's a turnoff for investors. Not sure how much that should weigh in your deal. So it weighs in your deal 100%. It doesn't make it a good deal or a bad deal. It's like if you're buying a property and you know there's an expense. I don't buy in HOAs, but if there was an HOA, you would know the expense. Add that to your monthly expenses and you add the insurance to your monthly expenses. And what's left is your cash flow. If the cash flow totaled up over the year, your annual profit divided by your cost to acquire gets you the yield that you like. That, that flood insurance is not a deal breaker. It's you need to be aware of it so that if you buy in a flood area, in a wet zone, and you have to have an insurance and you get a quote and you find out how much it's going to be, and then you calculate that in your numbers, if it's still a deal worth pursuing, you still buy it. That's not a deal breaker for me. It's just, I think the point I was making was somebody was looking at Tampa and somewhere else. Be aware of the things in that area. Like if you're going to buy in Hurricane Alley, I bet there's a different type of insurance needed there. If you're going to invest in New Jersey, taxes are a bigger concern than they are if you invest in Louisiana, right? Like So like know the local area, the nuance to that area that you're going to have to have if you're picking an area to go to. Oliver, do you set up personal checking or business checking accounts for your rentals? Also, how do you track your expenses on your rentals? Um, two great questions. Let me make sure I get to both of them. First, I have all personal checking because I don't have any LLCs. Long list of reasons why no LLC. And uh, here's my business breakdown. Right, this is you can make this as complex or as simple as you want to. Sixteen rentals. 
seven properties, six mortgages, right? So it's it's a fourplex, triplex, four or five duplexes, and a single family. Um, whatever the math is on that, <laughs> I think it's four duplexes, right? I should know. And uh, I have one checking account, one saving account, one credit card one excel spreadsheet with a tab for income and a tab for expenses on the excel spreadsheet my email is in the chat above if you email me i will send you a blank copy um it's really kindergarten simple it literally just says uh, here's the property here's the rent for each month and then there's two columns for each month because some of my tenants are section eight so i know when i got the tenants income and i got the section eight income um and then, then the expenses is um the date that it happened on the store i spent it at the amount and then the taxes, because that's a separate tax write-off from the amount of the write-off, the property that it's attached to or was used on, and then in the notes, what it was used for, and clearly tell the CPA what it is because you have different types of depreciation that I don't want to know and don't even have memorized, but it's something like bonus, scheduled, amortized, like I don't want to know what any of that is, that's why I hire a tax pro, and they needed that information to know that. So a simple spreadsheet with two tabs. Most areas require you to keep deposits in a separate interest-bearing account, so make sure you do the research on your local area for that, but that's it. There are some people who do a LLC for each property, a bank account for each property, a spreadsheet for each property, and um, I have some memory issues. <laughs> I don't want to have to remember any of that crap. I have one account, and then I kind of mentally tabulate that this is my reserve. This is my expenses, um, you know, uh, investing fund. That's, so this is the saving account. And then here's my checking account. So I, I could have at any point in time about $8,000 in mortgages go out. Um, so I keep twice that in there uh, for mortgages and expenses. And then a little bit padded for living expenses. That's it. Kiss principle. Keep it simple. For me, for you, you might like complex. You might like structure. Go for it. You can make it as simple or as complex as you want. And then Phil also took back a message to make me lose sleep. Julie, I'm serious here. How did you get to be so smart? <laughs> um, by knowing that I'm not. There are investors. I, th I think there are investors. But I don't know that I know too many, but that could do really well at stocks and crypto and grow, grow a business and invest in real estate. That's not me. I could probably have dedicated as much time, energy, and effort into stocks and done very well. I I, I watched Joe Kuhn's information here on um, YouTube. It's K-U-H-N. He retired at 54. He's in stocks and the three bucket method. And like, it all makes sense. And I could have, could have went that route. Um, but I don't have the bandwidth to do that and real estate. And I chose real estate. Um, so if you don't understand something well enough to explain it in simplest terms, you don't understand that thing. The highest form of learning is teaching. So every time I try to do something in real estate, I look at it from how would I teach someone else to duplicate this? And it makes it really simple to do it because then I'm, I'm looking at, I'm not an engineer, but engineers do really well at real estate because they, they structure everything. Like they engineer their plan to do the build or whatever they're looking at, they engineer real estate. These are the steps to go through to do it. Um, so thank you for the almost compliment. I think it was a compliment, but um, I don't think I'm smart at all. Uh, I'm good at a few things. That's a howdy. Haven't seen you in a while either. Hopefully you've been hanging around just quiet in the background. Uh, how would I negotiate with Open Door? I would watch, I think it was Anna Kelly um, with Zuber or one of the viewers from Zuber who recently had a video on one rental at a time where you, you watch a certain date. There's a certain date where they pass days on market and then you make an offer uh, at your number. So I think they're like any other seller. They've got an algorithm that says, hey, if it's not selling by a certain date, we start to look at a lower number. That's how I would negotiate. Same thing with any other seller. Watch days on market. The more days on market, the more strength there is in your position. And there's probably more to it than that, like literally knowing if it's 60 or 90 or however many days that they go, okay, this is a loss. We just got to sell it. Um, but that's how I would look at open door or any I buyer and any buyer seller. All night or header. Question. What are the risks of calling an income property a second home if the lender is suggesting this as a solution to avoid investment loan requirements? 
look at the number of days you're required to live there and maybe consider short-term rental and actually live there the required number of days. Figure out how long the requirement is for um, and don't commit fraud. That would be my suggestion there. But figure out, yes, to, to be a second home, what is the required amount of time required to live there? And can you do midterm rentals? You know, traveling nurses, corporate, something where uh, the, you are still there, the required number of, of days. And, and maybe you're renting by the room to traveling nurses and you just have your room that you stay in a certain amount of time. Um, I know that I have some friends that do tax strategy where they're in Washington three months and one day to have a no income tax state. And then they're wherever else they live. Um, know what the laws are. Talk to your tax pro and, and, and literally look at the requirements from the lender to make sure you're going to satisfy them. Because a lot of it is based on intent too. Make sure your intent is there. Uh, and then things can change, right? Uh, you might stay there longer. You might do, stay there less, whatever, have a story, have a reason. Um, but what your original intent, when you intend to do it, is, is don't try to find a way around the system. Try to find a way to make the system work for you and with you. But so tips for renting by the room. Todd Baldwin, B-A-L-D-W-I-N. I think I spelled that wrong. Todd Baldwin. W-E-I-N? W-I-N? 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 I don't know. Todd Baldwin. Google it. Uh, he invests in Seattle and rents by the room. He has great strategies on how he, he has tenant retention, how he does his rents, how he does the shared areas. Like uh, That's how I would do that. I would know local laws. Make sure that you are in an area where you can rent by the room because there are some places that restrict the number of unrelated people who could be in the same residence together. I know that some places are trying to get away, away with that. But know your local laws to make sure that it is legal to do that first. Um, and then research Todd Baldwin. Uh, reach out to him. He's actually on social media. He answers questions. Um, I know he, he's like, he's the next, he's, he is millennial millionaire. He's been in business insider. He's got articles about him. But one of his biggest strategies is he buys uh, renting by the room. The thing that I've heard the most, it's not the strategy that I do. So I haven't committed all to memory. But the one takeaway that I took was if I ever looked at renting by the room, I'd want to make sure I had as many bedrooms compared to as many bathrooms compared to bedrooms as possible. The more times you can have a bedroom assigned to a bathroom, the more stable your renting is going to be. You might have some times where you have two share one or something, but if he buys five or six bedrooms, he wants four or five bathrooms. Now you're trying to get the ratio as close as possible. Um, but yeah, he's killing it doing that. All Nighter Hider, my question is from a friend that should be here as I sent him the link. I'm sure he appreciates your thoughts. Thank you. Awesome. Appreciate that. Uh, for Better World. Howdy. Thank you. First time I think I've seen your name. Great channel. Very motivational comment, content. Thank you. And uh, let me know how your investing is going. I'd appreciate it. That's how uh, this open door property has been on the market since May. There you go. You've got you've got the time to look at a reduced rate. Um, see what they're open to. Try 80%, 90%, you know, whatever makes sense to your area. Uh, that I would definitely be looking at that. Um, and Brock, is there a Facebook group? Uh, Tacoma FI. So yes, it's not uh, members. It's not uh, only, It's that's everybody on the channel can go to uh, Tacoma FI. I haven't done a separate Facebook group for that, for the members only yet. Um, I don't, I should. I'll do a poll, a members only poll uh, on here on YouTube, and we'll find out what the thing is. I don't know how many people are on Facebook. I'm in several groups, but I would like to be in one where um, the members could share their information too. Uh, yeah. But right now, to the whole everyone, member or not, Tacoma FI. Uh, no, that's the wrong one. That's for people around Tacoma. Did I ever tell you I have memory issues? <laughs> oh, my time at the VA this week was awesome. Um, that poor girl. Uh, three amigos of FI. That's the right group. Three amigos of FI because it's uh, Zuber, Lumberjack, me. We might change it to REI Avengers sometime because Millennium Mike um, to make sure he's included. But fourth month good here doesn't sound as good as REI Avengers. Although I am an Alexander Dumas fan. Um, uh, where was I? 
Hey, Dion, is there a Facebook group? I know Zuber has one, but I think it would be cool. Could everyone or just members? Just a thought. So right now for everyone, three amigos of FI. Uh, members only, I'll take a poll and see what people say. It's awesome. Oliver, living in Seattle, I miss going to Leavenworth in the winter. Do you ever go with your family to Leavenworth during Christmas time? Um, uh, <laughs> all right, too much nerd talk. Matt behind me has a character that has a really cool name. And I named my daughter after that character. And in Leavenworth, there is a winery with that name. So it was really cool taking my daughter there when she was 21 to a winery with her name, which is a very um, not common name. And she got to get like bottles of wine with her name on it and wine glasses with her name on it. And she's like me, Dion. I've never been to a kiosk where you see keychains, pocket knives with everybody's name, like John and David and Joe. And like, there's never a Dion. I've never seen one. Um, so she's never seen that kind of stuff either. So it was really cool. I, I do. Yes, we've gone up there for the tree lighting. Um, I tend to go up there for 4th of July uh, most times. I'm not a fireworks fan. I don't like things going boom. So I go up there 4th of July and they do the fireworks way over in um, Wenatchee. So Leavenworth doesn't have all that stuff. And I have a great 4th of July every time. But I do like the winter up there. I'm not a skier, um, but I do... Uh, and I also like to do the rafting. You can do the four or two hour river rafting up there. And that's a summer thing, not a winter thing. <laughs> that is glacial water. Um, Sierra, since the conversation is winding down, I'd still love to know if you ever played RuneScape. I did not. My son did. I made uh, merch themed around that game as my first business, which makes me think of your wow hustle. Yeah. So when that RuneScape was around, mostly I was in EverQuest. Uh, so I've, I've, I went, my, my gaming went Ultima Online, EverQuest, World of Warcraft, four year gap to really focus on real estate and now back into World of Warcraft. Um, and there was a time where real estate became a better side hustle than playing World of Warcraft as a side hustle, <laughs> which was huge for me. Um, Anna Kay. Howdy, Anna. I never realized that there are quite a few invitation homes in my neighborhood. The single family houses are being listed to rent at very high prices they cannot be profitable so here's the really cool thing with a lot of people and i've had this conversation with um friends who are not investors driving somewhere you see an apartment complex going up and my friends would go man i'd hate to be in your position you get all those rentals and look at all these new apartments going up the the, the untrained investor mind going the, un, the non-investor mind going Supply and demand. There's more supply, so there's going to be less demand. No, that's not the case at all. A new apartment complex comes out. They do not rent it at a low amount. They rent it at a high amount because they had the expense of building it. They're not going to be profitable for three to five years on almost all new builds that become rentals, which jacks up the rents on the people who own their properties already. So every time I see an apartment complex going up, I'm like, oh, next year's going to be amazing, right? It's It's beautiful. So if you're seeing that, Anna, Watch your rents compared to theirs. Renters don't go, this house is one year old. This house is 19 years old. They're going to rent totally different. They go, four bedrooms, four bedrooms. Let's go take a look. Yeah, you might be a little bit less because it's not brand new, but you're not going to be significantly less. The Imposter Three Amigos were live too. I think that's... David Green, or no, no, it was Ken, Gammon, and somebody else, right? I don't call them imposters. I think it's a, it's a great title to go with. I watch their content. Uh, there's been some things that Ken has said a couple of years ago. He made a bad call, and um, he's more multifamily, but I really like uh, the the live between Ken and Daniil, his his wife, where you know she is, uh, I think she's 100%. She doesn't go debt. She pays it all off. Uh, she's got like three or four rentals, and, and it's, it's great. You know, his experience with his mindset of multifamily and hers as an investor and then doing the blend of it. Um, so they have great content. Um, I don't, I haven't watched Gammon and I haven't watched the other guy that's on there. I need to. Everybody keeps telling me I need to. And so I need to adjust the content because I still take in content. I, if there's people that are here watching, I think the average view duration is like 12 minutes or something. So there's some people who've been here for a while. So I appreciate that. Um, I'm still taking in content too. Uh, um I'm just hoping I share something that makes your investing easier and more stable. Uh, and I watch theirs for the same thing. I, I take away things all the time. Uh, I hear things I say 
all the time too. I don't think they watch my content. I think some of this is just like it, it germinates out into the the financial community and just becomes a thing. Um, Ash, howdy. Thanks for the live. Thank you. Cody, that's who they are. So, Ash, would you ever consider making a Discord? Um, that's a great question. I'm not on Discord much. I don't have it figured out. I'm on Discord when I'm gaming, but I haven't used it for anything else yet. When I do the members only live stream, it's it's on Zoom. And so, Ash, I'll put my email in here. Maybe you or anybody else watching can email me the benefits of a Discord for a real estate investing group. How would it work? Would it be on all the time and people could just get on chat rooms and do it? Because um, I have a Discord because I'm I'm a gaming nerd, which I've been transparent about. So don't be shocked. But um, I haven't thought about it for this format yet. Um, hit that like button. Wheel of Fortune on NES. Nice. Angelina, how many hours did you play to make gaming a side gig? My husband loves games and wondered if that is something he can do too. So I played probably two hours a day. Uh, one hour a day would be spent making money. I had my kids play. They would make money too sometimes. They would farm the materials that I would sell. But so when you're in an online game, right? And, and, I, and when it was Ultima Online, I was a virtual real estate um, wholesaler. I would buy houses in the game that people didn't know what they were worth. And then I would sell them to people who did and make a ton of money. I, I think my best deal was like $300 for a castle that I sold for $1,400 uh, because it was limited real estate for a while until they doubled the servers. But so I made money that way off of, you know, short bursts of time, but knowing what I was doing with things like World of Warcraft, depending on what kind of game they play. I don't know about Fortnite or first person shooters or that kind of stuff, but there are parts of the game that are a grind resources, things that are used to better your character. People don't want to do that work. So if you can find a way to get that work in the fastest way possible, and for me, that was a two computer system where I ran two accounts so that I could be using two things that most people are only playing one and get the resources, then then sell the resources, the boring stuff that nobody wants to do. Kind of like real estate. It's very boring to buy, to save a down payment, to buy a rental, to have a very boring rental, long-term tenant, not short-term, not sexy, not a burr, not a flip, not wholesale, just super boring and never have to work again in my life. Uh, some people don't want to put in the work, just like with gaming. The, although now a format might be gaming and putting it on Twitch, there are people that get like, you know, we're sharing real estate investing content on here. There are people sharing everything you can imagine on YouTube with often bigger channels than this, making a ton of money on YouTube. Um, with Twitch uh, gamers, streamers that can say, look, I'm gaming. This is the game. This is how I did whatever. Um, I don't do that. Uh, I don't watch that, but I know it's a thing. Um, so that's different than what I did too. And then Ken Macro walks up from Ellen. Hi, Ken McElroy, my old buddy, George Gammon, and the other buddy, Jason Hartman. There you go. That's in there. I don't know. I can't remember that. I grew up with a guy named the same name. Nicholas, Dion, what are your top five books you read? Real estate, financial. Thanks for clarifying because I was about to start busting out with some not. Um, one rental at a time, of course, uh, which I found around 2018 when I was reaching financial independence. And I was like, holy crap, if I found this five, six years ago, this information, my path would have been so much easier. Uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Cashflow Quadrant, I think should be required reading. Um, Think and Grow Rich, uh, Richest Man in Babylon, Set for Life by Scott Trench. I know I went over five, but uh, Cashflow and, and Rich Dad, Poor Dad kind of count for the same. Um, Set for Life by Scott Trench was really good. And him and Mindy Jensen did a follow-up book that had like a lot of the concepts that I like to talk about. Uh, it's like the book for the first time home by it's a really long title. I can't remember, but Mindy Jensen, Scott Trench were the authors. Uh, great book. Um, and then there was one that I liked for real estate. Uh, the Count of Monte Cristo. The idea being somebody got so wealthy, they could spend their entire life focused on revenge. There's beauty in that. Um, Tom, 
Well, I've been on the phone with my mom and I'll stop to drop it off and maybe you'll still going awesome. Nice. Still hanging around. And you can listen on double speed. Time to start a gaming channel. <laughs> no. Um, uh, so there's, there's this thing. I have this mildly addictive uh, trait where if, if I want to uh, be a truck driver, I, I, work at a truck driving school and become the company president. If I work in law enforcement, I specialize, I focus. I became like a scuba search and rescue. Like uh, in the military, I tried for meritorious promotions. Like I was like, I become hyper-focused on whatever I'm on. So when it comes to like trying to share financial freedom and financial independence, there's a there's kind of a reason why I haven't done a book and done a course is because I can totally create another job. I could totally do that. I could do the, hey, let's do $150, $200 an hour for phone calls. So I could try to do you know one hour phone calls with people try to fix your finances and, and t- turn it into an income. I don't want jobs. And so I, I do enjoy gaming now, right? And I'm trying not to make a job, but I don't sell anything from the games anymore. Um, I, I totally could. I have the resources right now to probably make five or 600 bucks this month on WoW. Um, yeah, so I don't want to make a gaming channel. I have thought, there's two channels I have thought about. One, transportation. You know, decades of information on how truck drivers can make money and not get taken advantage of by some of the scamming companies that are out there. Two, how a single parent, guy or girl, can get and keep custody of their kids because they did it three times in two divorces. Uh, in states that were predominantly the other gender would get uh, custody. So it doesn't matter what gender, the strategy that I used could help you get and keep custody of your kids. Those are two that I thought of, but I would be creating more work and I don't want to do that. This is the information I have the most fun sharing, and hopefully people benefit from from the most. Nicholas, what do you want your life to look like 10 years from now that you are, uh, that you're retired? Uh, Very close to identical to the way it is now. Um, And having 10 years of experience with good enough health to have enjoyed that 10 years. Uh, that's the problem I think with a lot of people thinking I'm a, that they're going to retire at 65. Because if you retire at 65, do you think the next 10 years are going to be very active? We have three phases. Go, go, go slow, no go. Try to retire before you get to the go slow phase. Um, so that's my goal for 10 years, to have enjoyed 10 years of financial freedom with good enough health to have enjoyed it. Um, so hopefully most of you can retire before 65, or if you're 65 now, more comfortably from the assets that you add to your portfolio? That's a great question, Nick. Thank you. My serenity, howdy. If a tenant moves without paying rent for three months, how do you recoup the money, find their location? Uh, I would talk to an attorney, get a a small claims court order, and probably sell it to a uh, what do you call it? Debt collector. Uh, in my area, I recommend Grim Collections. Uh, and that's in the Olympia, Washington area. But, um, and I don't, I'm not an affiliate or anything. It's just, I know that they do good work. Uh, that's what I would do. First thing, go through the legal system. You have a lease, hopefully. Um, and keep any communications you have with the tenants, especially email, because that can be used in court. Get a small court judgment in your order, which is not going to do you any good. But then go to collection agency because they have the, and they're going to take their cut, right? But they have the systems in place to find people, track employment. Because there, there are things, if you've ever ran a business, uh, you have to report to the state income so that child support services can know if somebody's making money. Um, and there's other ways that collection agencies can use to find where somebody's working. Doesn't always mean you're going to get the money, but what you can do is get it on the record of that person so that the next landlord might be likely to find it and not rent to them. So kind of paying it forward. So make a poll for my Twitch name. Yes, exactly. Might as well cross audience and hit as many of us nerds as you can, right? Actually, I'm uh, looking for a new guild for a while. Never know if you know somebody. Nicholas. I'm reading Rich, Richest Man in Babylon right now, kind of the Dave Ramsey of 1900s. He was, but he really talked about um, paying yourself first, getting that 10%, right? Getting that, like my video from this weekend, everybody's going to use your money. Make sure you're on the list of people using your money. Good book. And, and it does. It's a hundred and something years old, right? Like still stands up. Wealth of Nations. 
The Creature from Jekyll Island, Layered Money, Pitch Anything, and Market Wizards are my good. Your book selection's nice. Dating Channel. <laughs> um, I'm gonna, yeah, that'd be like a cooking channel, which I've taken an oath to never do again. So that would be my dating channel. Awesome. Don't worry, Matt. Thanks for joining the party. And you did show up late. Um, I hit the three hour mark, which is good. Uh, live stream went on and good as long as the questions did. I really appreciate the people who hung out. I hope the information is helpful. Um, I look forward to seeing you at these in the future. Um, I believe last week. So every Friday I'm doing a live stream midday um, with the lumberjack and maybe willing to Mike if he has the day off because he has that job. Ugh. Um, I don't know this week. I think it's on my channel because my memory sucks. I forget if last week's was on Matt's or mine. Um, or on uh, Millennial Mics. Could be on any one of the three, but keep an eye out. If you're available and you want some more of this content, Friday morning, there will be a live stream and I will have a video coming out Thursday too. So, Tom, how much will you increase your rent next year? Probably not using the binder, I assume. Correct. Use the binder this year. So next year, probably no rent increases. And then in 2024, my goal would be a 5% rent increase across the board with all tenants. Unless rent does something stupid crazy like it did the last couple of years, then I would binder again in 2024. Um, that's what I'm looking for there. Margaret, howdy. And I will be wrapping up after this, but thank you all for hanging out with me. Can you talk about what is coming? I keep hearing about it, that there would be more multifamily properties hitting the market. So multifamily being five units or more generally has bad debt structure. And that's why I don't like it. They have loan revaluation periods where you have to have a certain net operating income. We have to show a profit worth. If you don't, they won't refinance your loan or extend your loan um, without you having to write them a big check to make a gap between what your property is worth and what it's making or sell the property or refinance when you might not be able to. So a lot of those are going to be hitting the sell market. That's what people are talking about. Rents are softening in multifamily. A lot of syndications were doing purchases, projecting rent increases to continue for the next three years like they had the last couple, which uh, counting on that is kind of a bad strategy in my mind. So that's what they're talking when they say multifamily. That doesn't mean duplex, triplex, fourplex, because that's generally residential lending with 30-year debt. Most of us either purchased or refinanced in the last couple of years and have less than a 4% interest rate. So why in the world would we ever sell, right? So that's not going to be a big flood of that. But in the multifamily market, it's the debt structure, softening rents, and syndications planning on rent increases. Uh, there's probably more nuance to it than that. And if I was going to make a 10-minute video, it would be three days worth of research to put the content together to say, here's why multifamily is going to do that. But top of mind awareness, that's one of the reasons why I don't invest in that asset class is because of the debt structure. So thank you all very much. I appreciate every single question. And remember, whenever you see a live stream come up, we try to put them up like the day before or the morning of, and they're up for several hours. Feel free to put questions in the comments before we start, because the st intro of the video is yes to share a concept that we have going on, but it's to give the people who show up time to get questions in the comments. So the, if there are questions in the comments, then we can get to those sooner. Um, I hope you guys all have a week full of awesome. Thank you, Tiffany, for winning the dice of the eight-sided dice that I used earlier. Uh, email me, and we'll set up that Zoom that you won. Uh, next week, it won't be for members only when I do the Zoom, the Zoom call giveaway. Uh, it will be something different for that week. Until my next video, thanks for coming to my Dion talk. <laughs>